Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, 2014 has been the year of the celebrity bug. We'll take a look at this trend of giving bugs logos and fancy names and ask who it truly benefits. Plus a practical way to protect yourself from ATM skimming and how that actually works. And then it's a great big batch of your questions, our answers, and then a fantastic roundup. All that and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 191 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on December 4th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this year's show goes on. Our live stream, why that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. You should probably go check that out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher. Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, Alan, I feel like it's been weeks since I've seen you, but it's only been one week. But you know, like... Has it, well, it's been two weeks. Yeah, okay. That's, it has been right? weeks then. Okay, so I'm not yeah. a crazy person. I, I mean, know. we took one week off for Thanksgiving. We're back now in yeah. real time. And uh, I feel like uh, we're now just ahead of us looking at the holiday schedule. And the whole tech snap is like a mess. Thursday's Boy. on Christmas. New New Year's Day, or I'm sorry, Thursday's Christmas. Yeah, and New Year's Day is also a Thursday. So we have two yes. big holidays uh, that TechSnap's going to be challenged Other years, we were by. marvelling about how we managed to weave in and out yes. of all the holidays. And Dodge them like, like pros, yeah. uh, which helped contribute to our never miss a week streak. But we're yes. already formulating we're plans. We're still going to keep that. Yeah, we're, we're formulating. We're going to get to 200 for sure. No uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're at 191 right now. There's, I, yeah. I think I would do it from a hospital bed at this point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, uh, just a PSA. Uh, Brian Krebs' Spam Nation, I think, came out since we uh, last yes. joined, yep. A- yep. and yep. I picked it up. November. I got it on Audible, oh, and uh, nice. I've That's even uh, I've even started it. I just just started it last night, so I don't have any comments yet. But I here, you know what? I'll play a little sample. It's 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 already got my attention. On one side yes. of the battle were the aforementioned Dmitry Stupin and Igor Gusev, and their sister pharmacy operations, GlovMed and Spamit. On the other was RX Promotion a competing rogue internet pharmacy started by Gusev's former business partner, 35-year-old Muscovite Pavel Vrublevsky. Officially, Vrublevsky was the top executive at a company called Chronopay, one of Russia's largest online payment processing firms and a company that he and Gusev co-founded. Sounds like Brian Krebs goes uh, like deep into this online pharmacy thing. Well, yeah, but it, they kind of, you know, I remember from my days in, in the, that dealing with that type of stuff um it was all you know this series of companies and you know people a couple of people together and they build this company and then they split up and do separate things and you know or i remember you know these guys as the payment processor but then they you know uh they got into doing pharmacy or whatever uh Mm -hmm. because the best way to not get kicked off your payment provider for doing something illegal is being your own payment provider. Right, that makes sense. Or, yeah. and, stuff. and also, if you're, if you're the payment provider and uh, then you get the report from Visa, oh, look, somebody's running fake pharmacy stuff through your stuff, you need to shut that account down. You're like, yes, we will immediately close the account of those bad people that we do not want to do business with. Right. <laughs> um, and then we'll immediately open a new account under ourselves so we can continue to run our own stuff through ourselves. There uh, is right. also a, a write-up by uh, Cory Doctorow over at uh, Boing Boing. He reviews it. It seems like he gave uh-huh. it a pretty positive review. He to get a look at the mass-scale cybercrime that underpins the spam in your inbox. Yep, and uh, uh, he seemed to give it a pretty overall pretty positive re- uh, review. Yeah, and but but you can see the kind of the mix of you know trying to look legitimate and the and the you know just blatantly flaunting it like RX Meds or whatever. Yes, because that's what a real site that sells prescriptions is going to be called, right? Uh, or you know nobody sells prescriptions over the internet legally, right? Uh, and so it's it's quite the the mix of things. Uh, but yes. Uh, I'm looking forward to picking up yeah. a, a copy of that myself, yeah. and uh, I just have—I'm almost finished a, a series I've been going through of 
just you know so the next, fiction. Yeah. yeah i know i know how that goes it's so in the queue that's psa number one psa two, number two is we're helping those guys out over at that bsd now podcast you may have heard mm-hmm. about they're looking for submissions on how you got into bsd right yes uh so we do an interview every episode uh so we've had like 60 some odd interviews now and the first question we always ask people is how did you first get into bsd how did right. you get introduced to it how did you start using it whatever uh and the different varying answers we've gotten from all the different people we've interviewed have been quite interesting. You know, mm. there's like, I uh, call him Percival. One example is like, well, his brother had set up an OpenBSD router and then the hardware died. And when he was trying <laughs> to set it back up, he had trouble with the OpenBSD installer. So he tried FreeBSD instead. Uh, and it, the installer back then uh, was kind of a bit easier. And uh, so he did that and uh, ended up becoming a FreeBSD developer after that. How about that? <laughs> and then the security officer and stuff. All because of the, you know, at just the right time, the router failed and his brother wasn't around to fix it, so he had to. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact that he had trouble with the OpenBSD installer and uh, FreeBSD's sysinstall, the old installer nobody liked, uh, is the reason Colin got into FreeBSD. Or uh, the current security officer, uh, Doug Erling, he was into the, uh, the demo scene back in the day. Uh, do you remember those that were like tiny little like super optimized exe files that would have like a video oh. and music and stuff in them yeah or like uh you know oftentimes the uh key generators and stuff for pirated software would come with something like that fancy music and animation and stuff but it was packed yes. with like the tiniest yes. bit of code you could yes uh he was into that and didn't like having <laughs> to build them on top of dos so he was looking for something else and a friend introduced him to freebsd and then on and on and on and he, that's how he got into it and, you know, all these different stories, you know, oh, I started with Linux and had this problem and came to FreeBSD or, you know, my friend gave me this or whatever. And it's been really interesting to see those. Huh. But mostly we only interview developers and stuff or people that are working on stuff or have done something interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'd love to hear from the users as well. So uh, even if you're just a user, we'd love to hear the story of how you first got into BSD. And maybe that will give us a better understanding of how people get in and what things people look for uh, so that we can make it Easier to get more people in. Feedback at bsdnow.tv, right? Yes. So if you can make a video clip, that'd be great. But if not, just write us an email and uh, we'll put the video clips and uh, read some of the emails and put that together. And oh, that will be, be cool. our Christmas episode. Speaking of Christmas episodes, uh, this I guess we had three PSAs. This is the holidays. This happens every now and then. We don't, normally don't do this. But the third and final PSA is uh, we are looking for the best of moments from TechSnap. And all of the Jupiter Broadcasting shows, we want to give all of the hosts one week off but still have new content uh, and work in some of the best stuff that happened in 2014. Now, TechSnap is particularly challenging because a lot of the times it's big chunks of information. So how do you clip that up? Now, we might just do segments or something like that, but we need your help. If you could go over to, we'll have a link in the show notes. If you could go over there, click on that to do the best of submission form, put the episode title in there, a link to the episode, the time code when the moment happens, the topic and kind of what you liked about it, and submit that in. We're, that's going to a spreadsheet you can check for other submissions. Now, the Linux Action Show, because this made it in the Linux Action Show subreddit has had has a lot of submissions, so TechSnap needs your help. We really do want your submissions. That way, we have good stuff. Thinking of all the dreadful one-liners that people have pulled out of me (laughs) saying before. (laughs) Yeah, there's probably a lot of those. Going to make me look bad. So uh, you know what? Let me. uh, I'll link to. I'll put that link to this in the uh, show notes too. So that way, uh, hopefully, there's a challenge. (laughs) Hopefully, we get some good submissions. All the greatest things Alan has said. (laughs) All the great things. All of the great things. Uh, all right, there it is. It's in the show notes and uh, all of the links to everything we just Google talked about. Google is so there. screwing with you. I know, isn't it? I know. Only you see that, but it's so uh, awful. I just hate Google plus Docs these days. Space bar control Z. I know, I know. I got to get it down now because they keep really changing annoying, it on me. It is. But that's what you have to do. You know what? Well, let's. Uh, we, speaking of Brian Krebs and Spam Nation, our, actual, our first story is a Brian Krebs story. But before we get to that, mm-hmm. let's refresh our palettes with a great message from our friends over at DigitalOcean, our first sponsor today, DigitalOcean.com, and we've got a brand new promo code that'll hook you up for the month of December. Guess what? It's pretty straightforward. Snap December. One word, all lowercase. Yep. You get a $10 credit, Snap December, over at DigitalOcean.com. Now, why DigitalOcean? Easy. Su- super easy, really. I could answer that question in my sleep. Yep. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider. Boom, right there. They're dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to get access to your own server. And users can get started in less than 55 seconds. And pricing plans start at only $5 per month. That's going to get you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer for $5. And now you can see with that $10 credit when you use the promo code SNAPDECEMBER, 
Well, you could try out the $5 rig two months for absolutely free. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Amsterdam, Singapore, and London. Mm-hmm. But it's really about their interface. It's truly, truly great. It's intuitive, but yet very powerful. And power users can replicate it on a much larger scale with DigitalOcean's straightforward API. There's already a ton of great yep. community applications around that. You can integrate it into your Puppet infrastructure. It's slick. So go over to DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code SNAPDECEMBER. You can apply it to your account. You get the $10 credit. You know, DigitalOcean will let you pre-fund an account, which is kind of a neat way to go, too. I got an email from viewer Patrick recently. He said, you know, I did the best. I, d- I looked at all the different options, and it turns out not only was it more educational for me to go spin up a DigitalOcean droplet, but it was just cheaper than a lot of the Minecraft hosts out there. So he, yep. for $5 a month, has a DigitalOcean droplet now that he could use for own cloud. He could use it for WordPress and Minecraft hosting right. all, or TeamSpeak, whatever, Mumble, whatever. Exactly, because uh, when you're doing a Minecraft host, they're basically just multi-hosting, right? So they have they they have they rent one VPS somewhere, mm-hmm. like digital ocean, and then they they put multiple Minecrafts on it, and so you get know, your own dedicated rig. Yeah, uh, when you have full control, a you know that you, that you know you're going to have control over the CPU. Somebody else's Minecraft isn't going to lag yours. Uh, somebody else's Minecraft isn't going to run the machine out of disk space or something. Uh, you have complete control of the server, and that is uh, definitely a good one. Plus, you can take advantage of those system snapshots before you do a big upgrade or anything like that. You've yes. got the DNS management, the HTML5 console. It's really a great control panel. When you use the promo code SNAP December, you get the $10 credit. You can try it out for free. And don't forget, DigitalOcean is also willing to pay for great tutorials. If you'd like to go right for DigitalOcean, we have a link in the show notes. They'll pay up to $200 for a really good tutorial. And that's just because they want to make sure that's another aspect of their service that's better than everybody else. DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code SNAPDECEMBER when you check out. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Okay, Alan, so we're going to start with Mr. Brian Krebs this week. Yes. And it's interesting to like really go deep into the kind of these... It's like it's like a form of I I don't know if cybercrime is the right term, but it's a form of crime that's oh, happening this all the time. This is just regular crime, I suppose. Yeah, right. It, just right? it feels technology. like it, it feels like some journalist or whatever might label it as cybercrime, maybe because it involves some form of technology. But <laughs> I don't know. It's a very fascinating look, and Krebs is like the man to go to for this stuff. Yeah, well, he has the contacts to uh, do it. <laughs> um, uh, so banks in Europe are warning. Uh, well, sorry, the the kind of group that investigates stuff uh, for the banks. So there's basically a nonprofit that investigates this kind of stuff and aggregates it all and then sends out warning to banks. So they uh, were warning all the banks in Europe uh, about the emergence of a rare, virtually invisible form of ATM skimmer involving a so-called wiretapping device. Oh. Uh, so what they do is they cut a hole in the front of the uh, ATM uh, and then they stick this little, their gadgetry in, right? Uh, and they hook it up to the card reader that's built into the ATM. Mm. So instead of putting a skimmer into the throat of the card reader that reads your card before the card reader does, they're actually, you know, using alligator clips and hooking on mm. to the card reader that's part of the ATM. Interesting. Right? Uh, and then they cover the hole with a fake decal. The, you know, there's a little one that shows you putting your card in the machine or whatever, that something you would expect to be there. Uh, so you don't notice the hole they had to cut to stick their wiring in. Right. <laughs> that would be a bit of a giveaway. <clears throat> right. And so now they get the, uh, they get your card information, but you know, even if you look closely and poke at it, right, there's no card reader for you to see. All there is is the legitimate card reader. Right. So uh, they say the criminals cut a hole in the fascia around the card reader where the decal is situated. Uh, uh, the device is then inserted and connected internally into the card reader, and the hole is then covered with a fake decal. So, um, it's where a tap is attached to the pre-read head or the read head of the actual card reader. Uh, the card data is then read through the tap. Uh, so they still classify it as skimming, but technically the magnetic stripe of the victim's card is not directly skimmed. The data is just intercepted after it's read by the real card reader. So it still goes to the ATM as well? Yes. So basically, as you're using your card, they're just siphoning off the reading of the card yeah. without having to put it. So it's a lot harder to detect right. because, you know, even the bank employee, they walk up to the machine, they check. Nope, there's nothing stuck in the machine. It's all Right. Legitimate. And if I, if I check my balance or do a withdrawal, it would all be on my live account. So as a user, I wouldn't necessarily have any red flags, right? Right. And, okay. and so what they also do is they connect a camera somewhere on it uh, to record you typing your PIN number. Right. Uh, 
match the time codes up, and now they have your credit, your debit card number and your PIN number uh, with the whole skim of it, so they can write it to a fake card, walk up to a different ATM, type in your PIN number, and take all your money. And you think about it, like if you, I mean, it sounds, it sounds complicated at first. You know, you have to cut a hole, you have to put the stuff in there, you have to cover that hole up, you have to get a camera on the pins, but then again... This you, is all stuff they've been doing before. Well, just, I, yeah, there's that. But know, I was this just, one is you put, harder to detect. You put this on a on a popular ATM, you know, oh, yeah. how many customers does that maybe have in one day in New York City or, or somewhere that's yep. really crowded? It, it could be hundreds. I don't know. Yep. doesn't take too much work. You just have to really pick a good ATM. Yeah, and, and so it makes it really hard to detect uh, unless you can, if they use a really bad decal or sticker or whatever to cover the hole and you would notice that doesn't you know the whole machine is all branded by the bank and then this one decal doesn't make any sense Mm -hmm. but you know it's uh yeah so it's really hard to detect uh they also uh mentioned a new type of skimmer called an insert transmitter skimmer so most of these skimmers right it it fits into the card reader slot uh and has basically a second reader so when you stick your card in it's being read twice um the problem is with those that it records the data on like flash or something, and then the bad guy has to come back and take the card reader out uh, to extract all the stolen cards. So, you know, if the bank figures out that someone has installed a card reader here, they could, you know, have the cops be waiting and, and, and catch the guy when he comes back to remove it or something, right? So with this new one, uh, they put like a little small battery in it, kind of like uh, the BIOS battery that's in a computer. Yeah. Okay. And that lasts apparently one to two weeks. <laughs> And he can transmit a couple of meters away. So uh, he can set up some other device that will then receive the signal and record it or even retransmit it again over a longer range signal. Uh, so he never has to actually go back to the ATM that he's infected. And so much less chance of him getting caught. You know? Yeah, and I guess as this technology, so all the technology that's being used here is all commoditized. It's fairly cheap. It's um, miniaturized, right? Like this camera. Depends, yeah, well... Uh, it depends. If depends on what kind of criminal you are. If you're making your own devices, then yeah. yes, it's pretty cheap. Uh, if you're the less sophisticated type of criminal and you're buying this device from somebody who makes them, oh, okay, uh, yeah, they right. sell different tiers, right? Um, if you just want a little pinhole camera to record people pressing the buttons, yeah, that's pretty cheap. That's if you want thinking. the one that goes over top of the buttons and right. actually tells exactly what they press, so you're not relying on a camera, uh, then that's more expensive, hmm. and things like that. Uh, that makes sense. And so, yeah, uh, they were sh- uh, the, the Krebs article also has some pictures of how small and, and well-placed some of the cameras are. Like, they'll put a fake thing up or, you know, they'll uh, build it into the, the hood that's supposed to protect the pin pad. You know, the, 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 the little kind of rubber things that come up around the pin pad mm-hmm. that are supposed to make it hard for people to see what you're typing. Mm-hmm. Well, if they put the camera inside of that, <laughs> then it's... Right. Watching your fingers. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, or, you know, they'll stick a, an extra thing onto the thing that looks like it's supposed to be there but isn't and things like that um, and cause all kinds of problems. I'm trying to think, like, uh, like how you would do this as a criminal. Like, if, if it's a high-traffic ATM that makes it worth it, then you've also got the risk of being seen when you... How do, how do you get a loan with it long enough to yeah. cut a hole in it and do this? And, you know, if there's a line of people behind you, that's not really going to work. I'm thinking you do it late at night, you, like, park a vehicle in front of it, you have maybe a group of people there, something... Depends hosted. what it does, yeah. Right, uh, yeah. And that's why a lot of times these are targeted more at the... Uh, the ATMs that aren't in such public places, you know, ones that are in darker places out of the way or and you just let uh, it sit there for a while in stores or whatever, or places where they can be alone with it for a while without being mm-hmm. disturbed. Hmm. Um, so Krebs advice is it's best to focus instead on protecting your own physical security while at the cash machine in both ways. Okay. Uh, you know, if you visit an ATM that looks strange or tampered with or out of place, try to find a different ATM, uh, use only public machines in well-lit areas and avoid ATMs in secluded spots. That applies double. A, you know, an ATM that's in a secluded spot has more chance to have been tampered with because somebody can be alone with the ATM. And B, obviously, the other type of crime involving ATM is mugging you after you make your withdrawal. <laughs> right? So Much more old school. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> still either, works. either way, uh, the best defense is using, you know, public ATMs and well-lit areas, high traffic kind of thing because mm-hmm. uh, there's harder for them to uh, modify and, you know, uh, and it, like we talked about in that story with the iPads, uh, the ones with the metal buttons are better than the rubber buttons, you know, ones that are designed to be outdoors mm-hmm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, they say 
Lastly, but certainly not least, make sure you cover the pin pad with your hand when you're entering your pin. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that way, even if the thieves somehow skim your card, there's less chance that they'll be able to record your pin with yeah. the camera. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many people fail to take this basic precaution. <laughs> uh, yes, there are still a chance the thieves could use a pin pad overlay device to capture your pin, mm -hmm. uh, but in Krebs' experience, these are uh, far less common than hidden cameras because they're quite a bit more expensive, especially if you're not making your own skimming device. Right. Right, so you know, if I'm out there to steal money from people, I'm not going to do. I'm not going to buy the most expensive equipment to do it. I'm going to buy the cheaper stuff and maybe just do more ATMs with it and things like that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's uh, but yeah, it's, uh, two different advances in ATM skimming. There, are pretty interesting. Uh, it would appear that both of these would be uh, fairly well defeated by chip and pin type stuff. Yeah, uh, but you know, we've seen that there are problems with the uh, the chip, some of the chip stuff as well. So uh, takeaway from this story is, and I actually, do you already do this too? Do you like, do you like quickly scan the ATM and kind of like analyze it when you walk up to it? Like I do, I check it yeah. out. Uh, there's, I most times happen to go to like two or three specific ATMs. Yeah. Right. Cause they happen to be, you know, the grocery store I go to every week. So right. it's a convenient yeah. place to do yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it's kind of in a public area and it's well maintained. It's not run down or beat up or anything. And. Uh, or you know the ones at the in the lobby of the branch of my bank. Uh, so again, those are more well maintained. Yeah. Uh, and you know have a lot more security cameras and stuff to watch for people tampering with them. Uh, but I I definitely do remember seeing the evolution in the machines over the years as they grew like weird plastic things yeah. to try to make yeah. it so a skimmer wouldn't fit and yeah. and a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. And yeah, I definitely uh, take a look at it and make sure that I don't see anything hinky before I try right. to use it. And now I'm uh, thinking I'm going to be covering my my hand as I enter in the pin too. Yeah, just I've to... always done that, especially you know, in the type more public type yes, ATM. Right. There's a line of people standing behind. They could be you looking. And, you know. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm not worried about that, but you know, it's just a habit. Yeah, that's a good one. And it turns out that you know, doing that helps uh, protect from the camera, but also uh, if you do it and kind of put your finger on all the buttons, it also stops them from using the the heat sensor thing. To tell which buttons you pressed, if you actually touched all the buttons, even though you didn't press them, right? So that they're all heated up, so they can't tell obviously which ones uh, you were playing with. That's uh, one of those things where I'm like, uh, the germaphobe in me is like, uh, do you just have to put up with it, Chris? Just put up with yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're already going to be touching four yeah. of the buttons, I know, right? Yeah. What's the difference between touching four of the buttons? I know. I know. It's just if one... your pen number isn't using different numbers, maybe that's not a good thing. Uh, geez. Well, I tell you what, Krebs is really on this stuff. He's got, he's yep. got, the, uh, like you he's, said, the he's sources. He's always been just uh, fascinated on the, the skimmer stuff. It's kind of his pet project. Yeah. Uh, I, he's I, got uh, lots I, of I other good stuff, but we only have so much show in a week. <laughs> yeah, it is very fascinating. We could literally though. just have the Brian Krebs show every week. <laughs> could. The Krebs Action Show, Krebs Weekly, Krebs Now. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, Alan. Well, uh, uh, I, uh, I'll give you a full report on Spam Nation as I make my way through it. Uh, awesome. But in the meantime, why don't I tell you about my mobile service provider? These fr Ting has been friends of the show now for quite a while, I don't, almost two years. I know I've been a Ting customer for almost two years, so Ting's probably just a couple of months behind that. I became a Ting customer, and I was like, this is, this is amazing. So why Ting? It really is mobile that makes sense. It's no contract, no early termination fee. You only pay for your usage. It's a flat $6 for each line. That's really, really reasonable. And so because of that, I have three lines, right? And then it's just the usage of those individual devices. So if I have a couple of phones for testing or whatever it might be, and I don't use one very heavily that month, I'm not paying into some big contract for that. I just pay for my usage. This is great when you get a MiFi device too, or if you've got a family member who doesn't make a lot of phone calls, or in my case, an employee that doesn't make a lot of phone calls. It's an extremely economical way to go. But the best part about Ting is their customer service. They truly understand the geeky cell phone user out there. And that's why they know that when you call them at one eight five five ting ftw anytime between 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. East Coast time, a real human being answers the phone, and that human being is one of the phone nerds. They're somebody who loves phones and they're ready to solve your problems. You don't have to get transferred around. You don't have to do the phone tree dance. They also have an incredible online help community and an awesome dashboard. This dashboard allows you to control every aspect of your phone, disable a line when you don't need it for a little while, get right heads up style display of your usage, set alerts using their uh, apps for Android or iOS. But Ting has gotten even better for the those of you who've considered switching, but for some crazy reason haven't pulled the trigger yet. Maybe it's, oh, I don't know, that contract you're in. Yeah, well, guess what? 
Ting's on to you. They're offering $150 in early termination relief programs for customers who are switching to Ting with a contract. They'll pay you up to 50% per line that you have to get canceled. So break this down. Think about it like this. Noodle this. The average Jupiter Broadcasting audience member's Ting bill after they switch to Ting, $26. That's what the average JB audience member is paying right now for Ting. Is What are you paying for your smartphone plan? Is it more than $26? Yeah. <laughs> it's In ridiculous. Canada, you can't get a phone with a data plan for less than like $70 a month. It's no. sad. And this includes hotspot and tethering, all the features, right? So think about that though, right? If your average bill is $126 and they're going to give you $150 in credit if you have to cancel a contract, that's already a great deal. But if you go to techsnap.ting.com, you'll also then qualify for another $25 in Ting credit on top of the ETF relief program. You might be able to get away, well, certainly with n- not having to pay a cell phone bill for the rest of the year easily, but maybe well into 2015 as well. Techsnap.ting.com. If you already have a Ting compatible device, they're going to give you a $25 credit on top of that ETF relief program. That's nuts. That's nuts. If you don't have a device yet, they'll just give you $25 off any device you want. A feature phone, a high-end smartphone. Ting don't care. They're honey badger. You get whatever you want. You put it on a, you put it on a Ting plan. You're going to pay a flat $6 a month with no contracts, no early termination. It's a pretty great time to switch to Ting. So go to techsnap.ting.com. That way you get the double bonus with the TechSnap $25 credit. And it's a way to say thanks for supporting one of your favorite shows, techsnap.ting.com. They got all the options, including... An extremely great deal on the HTC One, a really fantastic phone, one of the best Android phones ever made, and they've got a great deal, and then you own it, no contract. TechSnap.Ting.com, and a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. You could also, it also just might make a great holiday gift since there's no contract. TechSnap.Ting.com. Okay, Alan, you know it's a phenomenon you and I have noticed. Quite a bit on the show, and that's sort of like these celebrity bugs, the branding of these bugs to like give them a name yep. and a logo. And we got an article that kind of breaks some of that down, don't we? Uh, yeah. The over people at, behind uh, it? ZDNet, they talk a little bit about, uh, they talk to some of the people that uh, okay. have been responsible for some of the naming of the stuff, and uh, they have kind of a breakdown of what happened with uh, Heartbleed and also a little bit about uh, Shellshock uh, and kind of comparing those and talking with uh, iSight Partners, the guys that uh, named the Sandworm team, yeah, and uh, basically getting the different sides of the story and looking at the pros and cons of having names for bugs like this and and things like that. It's definitely... Basically raising all the questions and, and to see what people are, are thinking. I mean, it's something I know that not just you and I have noticed is becoming more and more common. And yeah. I, I'm on the fence. I don't really know. I Part of me thinks it actually is a good thing in some ways, you know, getting awareness out there. It's, it's, it's good and bad. You know, there's a certain level of fatigue, so we yeah. can't do it for everything. Yeah, uh, yeah. It doesn't make know. it sound as bad or serious if they're all doing it, right? Right. And so, you know, if we need to reserve it for the serious ones, who decides what's serious enough? Uh, yeah, you know, how yeah. do we prevent the small stuff from, you know, yeah. There's a lot of questions. Uh, but yeah, it talks about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, naming the bugs like that. Uh, behind scenes info on how it came about and the different things that happened and um, a lot of the criticism that went on on in all the different directions. Okay. And uh, maybe we can kind of come up with a, a system for doing this better in the future. Mm, okay. So that's nice. Right? <clears throat> so they say, uh, if the bug is dangerous enough, it gets a name, right? So Heartbleed, uh, the way Heartbleed was branded changed the way we talk about security. Uh, but did... Uh, Giving bugs a logo make them frivolous, or is it the evolution of what information security is going to be from now on? Yeah. Uh, so, Heartbleed was discovered sometime before uh, Friday, March 21st, by a Google security engineer, mm-hmm. uh, and it was later shared with OpenSSL and Red Hat, and then later on shared with uh, Cloudflare, and then also Facebook and Akamai. Uh, so, the first problem there is, why does Google get to decide who gets responsible disclosure and who doesn't? Yeah. That is interesting. Uh, you know, uh, and I think a lot of the sharing that went on there was kind of back channel stuff, not uh, you know official stuff. Yes, very and, much. So. You know, then Google adopted the whole Apple style. We are not going to mention who we said what to when, because uh, we don't want to be liable for the fact that this was all, you know, done. But maybe wrong. then maybe that's a sign they shouldn't have been doing it like that in the first place. Exactly. 
or more it's a sign that people did stuff that maybe Google didn't approve of, but they're not going to out their security guys and so on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean it was, yeah, it might not have been a policy from the top at all, right? Might have right. Been, or it might have been a lack of policy and procedure for dealing with, you yeah. know, something a so critical. scale bug right. because it's kind of a different thing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, they got reported back then and then uh, um, things advanced and the OpenSSL guys had uh, decided that on April 9th they would do a disclosure, a coordinated disclosure of the bug. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in Finland, the security company Codenomicon had discovered the Heartbleed bug on April 3rd and reported it to their National Cybersecurity Center, uh, CERT FI, um, the following day, which would be April 4th. And, um, you know, and also by this time, more and more people had heard uh, at least rumors mm, yes. and stuff. Yep. and. And people were spreading the word, you know. It's the typical thing with any kind of secret. You People start showing off by telling certain people. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then the like, rumors oh, start. I'll tell you the secret, but you can't tell anyone else. And then that person's obviously going to do the same thing. And it <laughs> it's like high school or yeah. grade school all over again. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, the Finnish company, uh, Kodamicon, they immediately went uh, to work on a marketing plan, right? Uh, this discovery was going to launch their small firm no one had ever heard of mm. to like internet superstardom and it, you know so they made a logo and they got a website and they came up with the name and they were all set so that when the public disclosure happened on the 9th uh, they would have this website that would tell people how to fix it they'd be in a position uh, to sort of own the news in a way yeah and so on uh, so the original public disclosure was supposed to be on the 9th however after details started to leak and the open SSLs team decided that uh, since more than one group had already reported the bug, uh, you know, the Codenomicon guys had discovered it, uh, it meant that more people could discover it, and I mean, maybe bad guys could discover it and start exploiting it. So it it became better to uh, do the security release now as opposed to uh, waiting for the 9th. And that's why everything happened early on the seventh, and a little less organized than people would hope for. Yeah, in fact, they say in the uh, they say in the article that uh, it was a twenty uh, twenty seven year old Finnish graphic designer who just had a few hours to put the logo together because the site was going live immediately. So he had to hustle to to design the, the Heartbleed logo, which yeah, and that's why it's so simple. Yeah, but but it works. But the the crazy part is, um, or the the genius part they did there was in addition to you know the the PNG logo or whatever on the site. They made an SVG, right, the scalable vector graphic, mm -hmm. and they included that available for download. So it made it really easy for, like, you know, CNN to make a news logo out of it. Yeah. Or we saw, like, how many T-shirts and hats and all kinds of, like, it, it just kind of boomed all by itself. It was everywhere. Just because they made that logo in a way you could resize it to make it fit on a, everything. That was a pretty, that was a genius insight by the Code yeah. Comic Con guy, really. Exactly. Uh, just a graphics designer was like, yeah, this way everybody can do it. Uh, you know, I don't, they did, probably didn't put enough thought in it to think, oh, we're, you know, they didn't make t-shirts and try to sell them on the website, obviously, yeah. but it just, <laughs> they, they just, it happened that that's could what happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but so half an hour after OpenSSL published the security advisory on the morning of the 7th, Cloudflare had their blog post yeah. up, which mm -hmm. seems like might've been written and ready to be, to deploy as well, where they bragged, uh, in a blog, in a tweet, uh, that they were the first to protect their customers and how Cloudflare was enacting <laughs> responsible disclosure even though they had gotten the information through a back channel mm -hmm. and not through responsible disclosure. Super responsible. Uh, Super. But yeah, so they were basically trying to be like, oh, we were the first one to protect our customers because we've known about it since before everybody else. And, and you know, they were being the, the douches they always are. Mm -hmm. uh, they... they they're too good at that marketing PR stuff. Like, uh, you know, remember we talked about when they had the, oh, the biggest denial of service tech ever? And, yes. And, and yes. the backbones were like, no, it's not. Right. That yeah. happens every day. Yeah. Yeah. But they made, they got a lot of traction out of it, though. <laughs> yeah. Because the, they had the guy and they, they convinced CNN and they, they were on the news, right? And the, the you know, sysadmins and, and network engineers that work in, in the data centers and stuff aren't on the news. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the director of marketing for Cloudflare gets on the news. Yeah. Uh, so an hour after Cloudflare's little surprise, uh, Codenomicon tweeted and announced their, uh, the, the bug and gave it the name uh, and launched their website. Because originally, remember, they were planning to do this on the 9th. But when they saw that Cloudflare was uh, already, you know, trying to claim they did everything or whatever, uh, 
they uh, Konamicon released their stuff in the website, uh, which had the instructions on how to fix it when ver- uh, lists you know which versions of uh, different operating systems were vulnerable. Because if you remember, the uh, FreeBSD nine wasn't vulnerable because it was using uh, a version of OpenSSL that didn't have the feature that had the yeah. bug in it. Yeah. Uh, but FreeBSD ten was, and so on. And so there's lots of uh, chance for confusion over which ver- uh, which OSs and which packages and so on were vulnerable. So they had all that information spelled out. And obviously, like we mentioned, they had that SVG logo that uh, made it a- easier to- for everything to go. Anyway. Yeah, sure. So yeah. then uh, Heartbleed, which was originally called CVE 2014-0160, uh, became a household term overnight. Even though average households still had no actual understanding of what it was, everybody knew that it was a thing. Right? And the media mostly didn't understand what Heartbleed was either, but it had a logo, and it was easy to splash that logo up on every screen in the world, right? And every a domain to send, site. and a well-designed website to send more people yes, to get more information. To get to, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it was uh, good because that meant organizers and organizations who needed to uh, remediate Heartbleed uh, knew it was critical and moving fast, right? So, like, uh, the Canadian government shut down the tax website because it might have been vulnerable and, and you know. It's true. Everybody uh, worked on it faster because there was all this news coverage, right? If it had just been another CVE and it hadn't been on the news, you know, people's bosses wouldn't have been harping on it. Have we fixed Heartbleed yet? <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, in certain critical cases, maybe that amount of media coverage is good. But like most things, media just sensationalizes everything and, and it doesn't necessarily help. <laughs> right? We had the... Um, uh, Bruce Schneier thing the other day talking about how, you know, just harping on every one of these is, is just going to make people numb to them instead yeah. of helping, right? Yeah. Which has been a concern of ours, too. Yeah. Uh, so in the end, it seems Heartbleed was a success, right? Most systems were patched within a couple of weeks, which is obviously too long, but still, uh, you know, we've seen other critical patches for Java and stuff where people are still running <laughs> 1.6. Yeah. Um, and so seeing, you know, 85% of all the systems get patched quickly enough is good, although a lot of systems didn't follow the full procedure, right? And only like 20% of people ever did the whole revoke your old SSL certificate and get a new one and the password resets and all that stuff. Um, whereas, uh, you know, we've seen some stories since then about, oh, because of Heartbleed and we didn't reset our passwords, our VPN got mm-hmm. Heartbleeded and they had the passwords and so they got into it later and were able to sit on it for a long time uh, until we found out they were in there and had to change the password. Yeah. <laughs> and we've uh, suspected it in a couple other hacks uh, where we haven't known how they got in. And we're like, I wonder if, you know, they got a password. That they got the password they used to get in from uh, running Heartbleed against that endpoint or whatever. Uh, so, you know, not everybody did all the steps they did, uh, but at least they did something uh, which probably helped make sure that Heartbleed wasn't a bigger thing than it could have been. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and then, so on to the next thing, uh, when they talk to uh, iSight partners about, the, in this case, rather than naming viruses and stuff, they're naming groups, uh, right? So, you know, we had the uh, APT1, the Chinese <laughs> yep. group, or, yep. or the, the sandworm group, which really confused the media because they thought it was a worm and it was a bunch of people. Not the same thing at all. Right. But, uh, they happened to be using one exploit at the time, so I think that one honestly caused more confusion than it actually helped. Uh, but they have a decent justification for why they do it that way, right? They say, in justifying the name, uh, the iSight partner says, without naming these teams, it would be impossible for a network defender to keep track of all of the different ones. Uh, we think that's essential because hmm. immediately, uh, intimately understanding these teams is the first step to mounting an active defense. Uh, giving a team a name, a name, as they did with Sandworm, uh, helps the practitioners and the researchers keep track and uh, attribute tactics and techniques and procedures. So it's like, you know, we notice that this team always does this, whereas this other team is doing this other thing. So, you know, which one, when you're seeing an attack, you can better understand which one it might be and things like that. Uh, yeah. It seems, though, hmm, you know, when I hear this, it seems like it it went well. Uh, I, I kind of I kind of would have liked some better uh, disclosure. Before it went public, I mean, sure, there you could Which equivalent that one? stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was kind of a mess. Um, like quite a few things happened all over the place. But if you change out uh, some of the components, 
this could also be a disaster. Like it, it doesn't mean yep. just because Heartbleed worked out doesn't mean the next time it's going to work out really well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, honestly, when you're looking at it, it looks like Heartbleed was supposed to go fine, uh, but because of the scale and the, um, the just how unique and big this particular bug was, mm-hmm. uh, people kind of lost their heads a little bit, and uh, you know, too many people talked. And yeah. honestly, it seems like the time scale was too big. Like normally, you're you're asking people to sit on it for a week or something. Right. Uh, in this case, uh, people were sitting on it for far too long. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, at least uh, <laughs> that one happened to work out. But uh, yeah. So on to the next thing. Uh, we had uh, vulnerabilities like Poodle. Yeah. Uh, they cited an article here from uh, CNN Money. It's awful. Uh, that was alarmingly bad. Like. You know, the, the, the reporter's like, blah, 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 woof, woof, in the middle of the article. Poodles are attacking the internet, is the headline. Yeah, and it totally downplays that, you know, this is an important thing where, you know, your crypto could be downgraded and bad things can happen. Yeah, this would be an example of where the branding doesn't work out so well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's literally know. a woof in the middle of the article. Yeah, and, and a bunch of dog references. It just makes the whole thing look like a joke. It reads more like an Onion article, except for the Onion's more well-written. Yeah. Um, you know, in this case, Poodle was a little bit of a backronym, but, you know, they didn't pick it because it had anything to do with dogs. They did because it was the acronym, right? It was a padding oracle attack, mm-hmm. downgrade legacy encryption or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's a clever name, technically, but uh, obviously didn't have the targeted effect for... Uh, you know, yeah. Compared to like what was the other ones like Beast and yeah, uh, yeah. what was the other one? I forget, but yeah. Um, so that one probably didn't go so well. It, I don't think Poodle ever had a logo per se, and so on. Uh, but then you have Shellshock mm. as like the complete anti case, right? This is an independent researcher that came up with it, not a company. Uh, so he didn't have a graphics designer, uh, and so on. Um, <laughs> So it didn't have a logo or an official website, which is actually part of the problem. Uh, I think even with Poodle, there was like a, a Google yes, blog yes. post with the paper, but then some other site kind of became the semi-official site. And it had some longer domain. Like it wasn't the whole domain wasn't dedicated to this. It was just a sub page. And, and so it made it harder to find stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely did. So sometimes having a dedicated page with all the information is useful, but then who's responsible for maintaining that and updating it and how long does it live and... All kinds of craziness. <clears throat> but yeah, so uh, there's a timeline over on the security list, but uh, the shell shock is quite an interesting one. Uh, when it was actually discovered, the author called it bash door, as in back door. Uh, and, <laughs> and then uh, he had done responsible disclosure to the creator of uh, bash and uh, was working with uh, some of the distros to get that sorted out and was planning to release it to the... Um, uh, the other distros and and, and have a, a normal patch cycle, but uh, in one of the, somebody somewhere that got the advance notice about it uh, took that advance notice and showed it to the press, uh, and so someone was obviously planning to do something with this, uh, and it went further, mm. and the person who leaked it uh, or the press or somebody came up with the name Shellshock, not the creator of it. Oh, okay. Uh, so this led to some immediate confusion. Is Shellshock the same thing as Bashdoor? <laughs> yeah. Right? And, you know, uh, I, for one, had never heard of Bashdoor until I read about this art- this today. Huh. Uh, you know, it was Shellshock when I heard about it uh, in the middle of a conference while I was in Europe. Um, and as further, because the initial fix for Shellshock vulnerability didn't entirely solve the problem. Right, I remember that. Uh, so if you read the actual timeline, the very first fix... Uh, never was released it because it was trivial to work around it. it went back and forth many times and then the final fix came out and it turned out that it didn't fix everything uh, and so then there was a second fix that actually fixed it so people thought they were patched and they weren't right mm, okay um, and then I remember we had all these other vulnerabilities that were discovered when people started looking you know when people saw what the vulnerability was that was shell shock uh, they started digging into bash and we immediately found like four other vulnerabilities in Bash yeah, that yeah. were unrelated necessarily. Yeah, right. They're maybe tangentially related, but were not the same bug at all. Each of these got a unique CVE number uh, to be tracked properly, but they were all kind of collectively began to be called shell shock. 
even though, you know, if you installed the patch for the CVE that was the original Shellstock vulnerability that was fixed, you would think you were secure, but you were missing three other patches. Because you patched Shellshock, but there was these other things that were now becoming called Shellshock, even though they weren't Shellshock, right? And so in this case, having that one name almost kind of backfired in that it became, the meaning was, was less uh, specific, right? And that caused all kinds of problems. Yes, no kidding. And, you know, it didn't have a logo or a website and, and so on. Where's the fun in that? Uh, so they had a great closing quote here, uh, of kind of relating to Shellshock, back to the Heartbleed. Mm -hmm. The researchers didn't tell their closest business buddies uh, in a game of telephone, uh, or one in which Heartbleed became uh, an arm race of egos, insider information trading, and uh, opportunism. Right? So that's kind of what happened, right? Uh, people that knew about it, you know, wanted to uh, show off with how much they knew and they knew right. this big secret. Uh, so they went and told other people. There's a lot of money in this insider. industry now, too. Yeah. Uh, now, with the Heartbleed, uh, the Google side, obviously, there wasn't much, you know, they, they weren't trying to make a name for themselves as a security researcher. Now, right. Codenomicon was, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't look like it was, it was Codenomicon that was leaking the information to Cloudflare and, and other people and letting them patch before everybody else, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you had a bit of that. And then obviously the opportunism of Cloudflare being like, oh, we were the first to protect our customers. Right. Like, technically, wasn't Google the first to protect their customers? <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, and, and so on. Uh, and the insider information trading, right? We had, you know... How did Facebook find out about it from Google? It's like, was it, is there some little... <laughs> it, I'm just picturing, you know, the people that work at the pair places end up at the same bar and, and some chatting happens and then all of a sudden uh, Facebook knows about this secret vulnerability or whatever, right? Yeah, and, so and, and, and it helps to be in the inside club in that case. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know the whole story, but I know uh, there was some fallout from that type of stuff. You know, uh, I don't want to mention any names or something, but uh, someone I know was asked to leave their employer and find different employment after they uh, felt that the way things happened was not correct. Hmm. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose there's all kinds of things like that that happen behind the scenes when these big, big things happen and we don't even ever really know about it. Yes. And when there's insider information trading and it's like, well, that's not fair. If you're going to tell these people, you have to tell other people as well. Right? Mm-hmm. Hmm. hmm. Well, Alan, uh, it's it's been an this probably been I don't know. So I yeah, think one of the more a couple of questions up basically. Uh, so who gets to decide what bugs are bad enough to get a name instead of just a CVE number? Right. Uh, well, should MITRE uh, the people that assign CVE numbers start tracking the names and attaching them as part of the CVEs? Well, it would seem like sometimes the names get decided in a sense by the press because the press just sort of start collectively calling it shell shock, right. and that's and, what it becomes. Exactly. It kind of reminds you of, uh, they kind of talk about this a little bit in the in the article of, you know, naming serial killers. It's usually not the cops that name the serial killer, it's the media. Um, but especially in the cases of these uh, security things, the media doesn't know what they're talking about. You know, they were calling Heartbleed a virus, and it's not a virus, right? And so on. And so they're not really confident to be naming it either. And obviously there's downside of, you know, if if the researchers are naming it, um, you kind of have this, is it an independent researcher who's just giving it a name to help track it? Or is it a company who's doing it to try to make a name for themselves right. kind of thing? Which is going to happen more and more. It's a big market. Yeah. Uh, so I think looking back at 2014, this is one of the more interesting things. This kind of started, what, uh, back in April? And it just yeah. sort of picked up. And it's it's like when you find an asteroid or any other kind of discovery, like somebody wants to name it. There's there's that element, yeah. too. It's like, I am the one that discovered it. I want to put a name on it. There's almost like a I've pride aspect to it. I'm surprised that none of those, uh, unlike comets, have not been named with the person's name. Yeah. But I guess you don't, the, 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 the vulnerabilities have a negative connotation, and you don't want your name <laughs> forever plastered over this security flaw that was used to ruin That's people's true. businesses and stuff. That is a good point. Uh, but yeah, so... Uh, it's an interesting question whether, you know, the CVE number should start tracking the name as well just to kind of create that cross-reference there. Uh, but then, you know, who officially signed the name? And then we have like a f aliases field because remember the, um, the WGET one 
uh, people were trying to come up with names for it, and none of those names officially stuck. But you know, people had proposed names and started talking about it using yeah. those names. Yeah. And how do we decide what names are official? And yeah. it just leads to a whole mess. Yeah, it does. Uh, and then the other thing is looking at who gains uh, more from naming the bug. Is it the end user who gets protected because the extra attention about it meant it got fixed, uh, or you know they're just aware of it so they know to look out for it or whatever, uh, and are able to protect themselves? Or is it more, you know, the PR-powered firms mm. uh, that exploit it for their own good, like the security researchers, uh, the commercial security researchers and so on, uh, rather than the academic type, uh, and, you know, places like Cloudflare that just want to uh, take advantage of name. it to, to make a name for so themselves. This is why I think it's not going away, is this question right here. Because, in a way, everybody because benefits. so much money to be made, yeah. especially in commercial security research yeah. now, yeah. where before it was always academic, right? You, right? you wrote a paper and you got yes. to present at a conference and that was it. Right. Now you're talking about, you know, rock stars and then, you yeah. know, crazy perks and, and working and, in a silly office and you know, uh, the water like slide. And <laughs> these guys, these these security consulting companies are getting funded at, you know, 26, there was, there was a story today about one uh, that I've never even heard of before that just got a round of $26 million in funding, right? It's just a lot. So there's a lot of money for them. There's yeah. positive and, aspects and for end users. About, there's positive talk, aspects for the press. Everybody's going to, mm-hmm. everybody's in, Alan. Everybody's in on this. It's well, not we, going away. We, we kind of talked about that uh, with that article about the 11 reasons why this was bad the other week right it's like the media doesn't know what they're talking about but they're getting copy out of it so they're just going to keep printing it right well but in a way like it is easier for some for the for okay so if i'm watching cnn and wolf blitzer's up there talking about heartbleed i'm like what the heck is wolf talking about i can at least go google heartbleed but like remembering like MSKB19 or yes, yeah, CVE dash, you know, like that's a lot harder as a, somebody yeah. watching casually to go get more info. So that's another benefit of it being branded is it makes finding information out at least somewhat easier. I don't think yeah. it's going away. I guess we'll, and we'll be right here to watch it. It's been mm-hmm. an interesting development of 2014. Yeah. Uh, all right, Alan. Well, I'll tell you about another interesting development. That's the great folks over at IX Systems, where you can go over there and get yes. yourself developed a rig built specifically for your needs, powered by those great Intel Xeon processors. They have an awesome, awesome setup over at IX Systems. So first of all, the pre-sales consultation is better than most companies anywhere, when it's just any consultation. But it's their pre-sales consultation that's that great. But it really is a white glove experience end-to-end. And they do battle-tested burn-in QA process. That way, when you get the hardware, whether it's at your local facility or you're sending it to a data center, which you'll never physically step in, you know it's going to work. And you know the people behind those systems fundamentally understand the technology from a hardware standpoint and a software standpoint. In a lot of cases, they're some of the folks working on the very technology you implement. Yeah, um, you kind of you've heard of like full stack developers and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I, I've never really thought of that before in the concept of of where I buy my servers from. Right. But they 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 are right. They're the integrator. You know, they're assembling the server for you. Uh, you know, they but obviously they don't make the hard drives and the CPUs. They get them from Intel and Western Digital and so on. But uh, yeah, they 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 understand it from all the way up the stack, right? So they're they're getting the physical hardware, they're putting it together, they're getting the the drivers that. Uh, the devices that have the right drivers, getting the right drivers, putting it together, and the operating system and stuff. So, you know, if you're buying a server to run open source on anything, they're definitely the place you should go to. Yeah, and they're able uh, to do it now. It's such a you can you can run Windows on it too if you want, <laughs> but why would you want it? You to? know, I actually did try it when I got my FreeNAS. So the FreeNAS Mini is one of the iX uh, systems that I own. And it comes with a really easy USB, like I think it's plugged into, I can't remember if it's onboard USB or onboard SATA, but it's plugged into the port, and I can yeah. auto-restore at pretty much any point. So I was like, well, before I get going, I'll try putting Server 2012 on this. It went just fine. I put Ubuntu on there, went just fine. And then when I was all done, just restore it right back to FreeNAS, and I set it up for production. Um, yeah. and, and I was just like, this is a great process. And it gave me like the peace of mind knowing that if I ever had to do that once it's in production, it was going to be a slam dunk. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you saw this, but they just posted a wrap-up from Supercomputing 2014. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They were giving out beer. Yes. They were handing out beer at, at, at the... Now, that is an event. See, if, if they would have told me there was going to be beer, Alan, <laughs> I would have made the where, trip. Well, Supercomputing was where? I don't care. I don't care I at all. It was on the East Coast at that doesn't time. Doesn't matter. I doesn't matter. They're, they're, they, I think Supercomputing is two different locations. Something I don't remember. Had beer, Alan. Uh, and yes. They go to uh, lots of places. Uh, and flash uh, some hardware, too. I would have loved that. to have made it to Supercomputing at some point, but... Uh, New Orleans. It was too close to... New Orleans. Uh, yeah. uh, meet. Uh, meet BSD. Yeah, I know. It was uh, in New Orleans. And, you know, if, I, cool, if huh? I had managed to make a second trip uh, close, it would have been the OpenZFS Developer Summit. 
Uh, but that was even closer to Meet BSD. Yeah, I know. Yeah, crazy. That is. They've got true NAS rigs too for enterprise grade storage. They also, when you go to ixsystems.com slash techsnap, have the ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source. 11 key traits you must absolutely demand from your provider. You can put your info in there and download that for free. It's a great, great ebook, and they're not going to like spam you. It's just a give you some uh, clear elements to pull out from. And when you're talking to maybe management above you about why you'd want to switch hardware providers, it's going to have some good info by that. It was written for IX, and it's a really good good write-up. Check out their TrueNAS systems, too. They're pretty slick-looking rigs. Yes. I really you want know, one. If you need real enterprise features, it has the little bit extra that makes it yeah. that much more. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, they're, they're, you know, and it's one of the things that's great about IX systems, and it makes me smile. It's like I the other day in Linux Action Show, I'm covering news by John Hubbard, and I'm like, this th- this guy is... Jordan Hubbard? Jordan, yes, thank yes. you. Uh, Jordan's talking about, uh, you know, changes in the, the next 10 years of free BSD, and he's laying it out there, and I'm thinking, and these are the people that work at I... He's, he's the CTO at IX Systems. Like, they work at I... Like, they... I cannot, I cannot imagine a time where I would have had a vendor who would have so intimately known the very products and solutions that I was deploying. I mean, it is really the yep. perfect or match. If you watch the videos from the OpenZFS Developer Summit, uh, the they did a, a platform summary where uh, presenters from all the different platforms that run ZFS uh, were talking about it. So there's one about Illumos and one about Linux and so on, and there's one about FreeBSD presented by Zin Li, who's uh, one of the lead engineers over at IX Systems and also the deputy security uh, officer of FreeBSD. That's some credentials. And, uh, one of the one <laughs> of the lead developers on the ZFS stuff in FreeBSD itself. Wow, that's there yeah. you go. IXSystems.com slash TechSnap just you know, just go check it out. I think you know yes. why we talk about it. We love IX systems. Yeah. That's why my basement is full of IX systems hardware and boxes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of conferences, episode 66 of BSD Now is out, and I believe you have a conference connoisseur in it, don't you? Yes. Uh, we talk with uh, Paul Schenkeveld, uh, who's the uh, chair of the EuroBSD Con Foundation, uh, which is a foundation that helps uh, because the conference, the BSD conference in Europe, is run in a different country each year. Mm. Uh, it has a different organizer each year. So there's um, uh, a nonprofit that um, helps share, uh, retain the knowledge, right? So that each oh, time yeah. they're doing the next conference the next year, sense. they're not starting over, right? And so on. Yeah. Uh, because the you know, uh, it's kind of a contrast to BSD Cam, which is run by the same great right. guy every year. Right. And, you know, he's built up all this knowledge that he has himself and he, he's willing to share it. But, you know, it's it's not the same as, you know, your first conference never goes as well as your second one, right? Yeah, that shared uh, knowledge is super valuable. Yeah. That's a great and it idea. Also, some of the infrastructure, right, they did for payment processing. Stuff. But, yes, it was a great interview. And uh, he just has some great stories about uh, BSD and and also, specifically, he's not a developer, right? He's more of always been like a sysadmin, and he talks about ways that you can contribute oh. without having to be a developer. Very good. That's that's a great listen. Episode 66 of the BSD Now show just hit the interwebs a little bit earlier this morning. So this is the halfway point of the TechSnap show. It's a good time to get that HD version of BSD Now downloading while we uh, move on to the rest of the show. Alan, is there anything else we want to cover in the news segment? Uh, nope, that's it. Okay, then you know what that means. It's time for the TechSnap feedback. Thanks for sending your email to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting site, or even better, starting a thread in our subreddit over at links. Nope, I think we're just going with techsnap.reddit.com now. And Alan, uh, we've got a good batch of emails. Our first one comes in, what do you think, Florin? You think that's how you say that one? F-L-O-R-I-N? Something like that. Uh, so, question about MD5. And I wonder if there's some other folks in the audience that might have the same question. He says, I keep hearing that MD5 is not secure for storing passwords, but I do not understand why. From what I have found, things like SHA-512 are about five times faster. He says, uh, I even found that in some places it said it was ten times faster on the internet than MD5. Today, my teacher at my university said that MD5 for passwords is just fine if you use some salt and uh, do it a lot of times, maybe like thousands. And that SHA-512 uh, uh, with salt and a lot of other rounds is just as secure and not more secure than MD5 because it's just a little slower, not making a real difference. From what I have found so far, I can agree with him. But still, I find a lot of places that say MD5 should never be used. Also, Linux switched away from MD5 to SHA-512 and instead of just adding more rounds to the default value. Why is that? Am I missing something? There's a couple different things. The first of all is the confusion between MD5, 
and MD5 crypt. So MD5 is a message digest or a hashing algorithm, and you never, ever, ever use that for passwords. Now, what he's actually talking about is MD5 crypt, mm. which is the version where you have a salt and you do the rounds and you store a password. And that's the way it used to work. The problem with the MD5 one is that MD5 crypt is not expandable, so you can't change the number of rounds. To be an MD5 crypt hash, it is always 100 rounds. Okay. Did not and know that, that was the problem. Uh -huh. One of the that reasons they went to using SHA-256 crypt or SHA-512 crypt is that as part of the hash, you have the number of rounds. And so you can turn it up over time. Whereas MD5 didn't have that feature. They weren't forward thinking enough. Uh, sorry, Paul. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Paul Henningkamp came up with uh, the MD5 crypt. He never meant for it to last nearly that long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so the problem with... yeah, So you shouldn't be rolling your own version of it using just MD5 and doing it a bunch of times. That's not the same thing as MD5 crypt. Uh, the problem with MD5 crypt is you cannot change the number of rounds. Um, the reason why SHA-512 is faster is because it was meant to be faster. The whole point is to just ca calculate a message digest, to see the checksum of a file to make sure it hasn't changed, or the checksum of a message and make sure it hasn't changed. The point is not to provide any security outside of that. And so it's a good thing that it's faster. Uh, also, because of a weird coincidence in the way it lines up, 64-bit processors can do SHA-512 faster than they can do SHA-256. Uh, but that doesn't mean you should use the lower one. It just means you should do more rounds to make it take longer. Okay. Um, so definitely don't do the MD5. You should do the SHA-512 crypt, not just SHA-512. Right. SHA-512 crypt right. uh, with the salt and lots of rounds, uh, probably tuning it so it takes at least 100 milliseconds. And uh, as as you are saying, and as Razo and is very pointly pointing out, uh, the yeah, author himself... Uh, uh, Paul Henningkamp's blog about how the MD5 crypt is official at EOL. Yes. Uh, he, because it was uh, beerware licensed, uh, which was, you know, it's free. And uh, if you really like it and you happen to be in the same place as me someday, you can buy me a beer <laughs> license. Um, yeah. It, so it's built into like Cisco routers and basically everything that copied the Cisco routers config file type syntax uses it. And Linux and every operating system uses it. Uh, and, you know, most of them have now switched to uh, having, you know, Blowfish or uh, SHA-512 Crypt. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, and yes, uh, there's a couple other problems with MD5. The first one is if you're talking about just regular MD5, it's susceptible to this thing called the birthday attack. Uh, so basically what this was is if you start with uh, two PDFs, uh, one saying the legitimate thing and one saying something else, I think the original version of the uh, that he came up with was an order from Caesar to his generals saying attack, and the other one said don't attack or something, right? Uh, and then by changing stuff in the middle of the file that didn't actually affect what was displayed in the PDF, but basically like comments and stuff, or just gibberish data or like you know steganography type stuff, to keep modifying the two files until um, both of them have the same MD5 hash, even though they have completely different meanings. Mm. So now you can swap that file out in an encrypted email or whatever. The hash will match, and it'll say, no, yeah, that's that's the legitimately signed email, uh, even though the file doesn't say what it originally said. So that's the problem with MD5 is that someone can can come up, uh, can make a collision happen at will almost uh, so that they can do that. Roger that, yeah. Alan. Great explanation. Yeah. Thank so, you. So uh, it's not about... Uh, for as far as being faster or slower, you want to use the crypt variant and you can adjust the rounds to make it as slow as you need. Uh, and so, yeah, SHA-256, uh, SHA-512 crypt is uh, probably the, one of the best choices. The other one, obviously, is uh, bcrypt or the Blowfish crypt one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's because currently no one has found a way to make the Blowfish one faster on GPUs. Right. Uh, where obviously GPUs have been tuned quite well for SHA-256 because that's what Bitcoin and so on uses. Yeah. We're going to get a little more to brute forcing passwords, uh, uh, not in our next question, but the one following. Oh, yes. Uh, your university professor is pretty wrong. Uh, you can yeah. do MD5s on a graphics card pretty damn fast, uh, and you should definitely... Uh, the main reason the problem for MD5 is that you can't change the number of rounds and it still technically be a valid MD5 hash because there's nowhere in the hash string, right? Dollar sign one, dollar sign salt, dollar sign hash. 
uh, where you can store the number of rounds. Whereas in the SHA-256 uh, uh, SHA and 512 crypt, mm -hmm. there is a separate field for that. And bcrypt. Now, bcrypt, they do it a little differently. They store a logarithmic value of the number of rounds. So every time you increase it by one, it does it 10 times more. Uh, so it's kind of a different approach. But either way, those ones are better because they're adjustable, and uh, you should use those instead. Uh, MD5 is bad. Stop using it. There you go. Uh, so David writes in, picking up on the uh, VMware problem we talked about last yep. week, I believe. He says, hey, happy post-Thanksgiving to Chris and Alan. I realize this is an overly simplistic solution, which probably indicates that I don't understand the problem. But he goes on. <clears throat> Modern operating systems can mark memory pages such that compliant hardware will treat the code pages differently than it treats data pages. Can you please help right, me understand? It's called the, uh, the NX bit or um, data execution prevention is right. what Windows calls it. Uh, can you help me please understand whether it would be feasible for the vSphere EXI virtual memory subsystem to recognize code pages in the guess allocation of memory and selectively attempt to deduplicate those pages with those from other guests, but not attempt to deduplicate pages identified as data pages? A naive way to do this would be to look at the WX flag, which is widely supported by both hardware and software. While this solution would not achieve the same oversubscription levels and indiscriminate deduplication, it would be more resilient in an environment in which guests are mutually distrusting. Am I on an entirely wrong track? I don't think so, although I don't know what the ratio of you know code pages to data pages are and so on. So yeah. I don't know exactly how well that would work. And I don't know how much that information is available outside of the operating system itself. Um, mm. As far as I know, like uh, data execution prevention and, and NX bit and so on uh, require the operating system's help to enforce it. And so I don't know, you know, does the memory allocator in each operating system do it in such a way that the, the hypervisor would be able to tell? Right. That would be the question, so wouldn't it? In general, it seems like your idea might work, uh, but it really depends mm -hmm. uh, how how much insight the hypervisor has on has, what the guest yeah, operating system has marked. Is actually doing yeah. and is marking. Yeah. Uh, also, as far as I know, I don't know if virtualization actually emulates that that feature. Uh, a lot of times, the hmm. hypervisor will will only pass through features it specifically knows that it can emulate yeah. or that are handled by the hardware virtualization. Yeah. That's a good question too. Uh, it seems like a reasonable idea, uh, but I guess the biggest question is, what is the percentage of the memory that's taken up by code pages versus data pages? Yeah. Uh, and if the number is, if the code amount of code is so small that the deduplication is not going to be enough, then it's not worth going through the, it, the effort and risking the mistakes you could make. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. To do it. All right, right, I could see that the risk ratio. Yeah, there. But it seems like even a 10, 15 percent, or who knows what it would be. Maybe it'd only be a two percent right. savings. But even that would be worth well, it. Well, ten percent savings. If maybe you can squeeze one more machine in. Yeah. But yeah, I guess it, practically. It yeah. yeah. I don't know how what ratios people were actually getting. Like you know, in the the use case they had an example of was running like forty. Windows XP guests. Right. It's like, that makes sense, especially if you're doing the um, virtualized desktop type stuff. Mm -hmm. So people have thin clients and then they're connecting to a machine over here. But, uh, you know, if you're talking about something like a VPS provider like DigitalOcean, I don't know that they would say no, very much Too much at different all. code, right? Yeah. But uh, another example that's happening today is Google is rolling out on their Google Cloud Compute system Windows 7 virtual machines to run Photoshop on Chromebooks, right? Like, that's a lot of common... Well, like, because uh, Amazon uh, tried to push something like that a while ago, although I haven't heard anything about it since yeah. they announced it. Remember yeah. the Amazon yes. personal workstations or whatever? Yes. Uh, so uh, this is a, it's a really interesting idea, David, and maybe what VMware's solution will be. And for those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, and uh, I can't remember if it was last week's or the week before, uh, but we talked about a bug where VMware is having an, an issue with uh, deduplication of memory and the vulnerability that they just said, all right, if you've got a problem, just turn the feature off. Don't even use it. Yeah. Well, and that was uh, their solution. Just turn it off. Just well, they haven't come up with a fix yet. No. And uh, so that's his question was, would this help? Yeah. And it, it's possible that would, yeah. yes. All right, Danimal writes in about brute forcing passwords. Question for you, fine gentlemen. I know very little about password cracking, but I was just curious about this. If a cracker is using, say, brute force to test millions of passwords, what is the indicator that the cracker got the correct password? Obviously, 
if you're using brute force on a live system, the indicator is you brute force the correct password and you'd be you get a successful login of the system. But I've heard of offline Wi-Fi password brute forcing and as such, I was just curious what would be the indicator that you actually got it? It's not like you could log in. I'm just curious what flag or test or whatever the brute force programs use to know the correct password from these millions of possibilities. Hope that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, so there's a couple different ones. Uh, so obviously, if you're cracking offline passwords, so if you have the MD5 crypt hash of a password, right, which will be dollar sign one, dollar sign the, uh, the salt, dollar sign the hash. Uh, so if you're going to brute force it, what you do is you pick a random password and then you run it through MD5 crypt with the same salt. And then that will give you out a, another string that's dollar sign one, dollar sign the salt, dollar sign the hash. And you just keep doing that until you get one that's exactly the same as the, uh, the password you're trying to crack. And then you know the random letters I picked hashed with the same salt come out to the same hash. That, therefore, it's that password. Yes, yep. Yep. Now, most times it'll be the exact password. There is a chance of a collision where a second password has the same hash. Because remember, MD5 turns any message, which could be you know the two characters of hi with five characters of hello <laughs> yeah. or... Uh, the MD5 hash of a 20 gig hard drive uh, virtual machine image down into a message that's 32 characters long, right? Uh, and so obviously there's a chance that there's two different files or two different passwords that'll have the same hash, but it's fairly rare. Yeah. Uh, obviously uh, with SHA-512, because the hash is longer, it's even more rare. Uh, but for a password, that's what you do, right? You use the same input information, right? The same... Um, salt, the same number of rounds, etc. And you keep trying random passwords until the hashes match. For the Wi-Fi one, uh, you keep trying to decrypt it with random keys until you get back the plain text that's not gibberish. Right? There's a certain structure to the packet and uh, you just keep trying until you get one where you can read it, right? It's the same way you would do any kind of, uh, where you're decrypting stuff. Uh, you just keep trying different passwords until you get one that comes out with something that you can read instead of something you can't read. Yeah. I mean, obviously what Danimal is getting at is like, obviously they're not knocking on the door every time because they would trip off. Right. So uh, for the Wi-Fi one, you can capture some of the packets out of the air, then take it home yeah. and brute force it until you find the magic key uh, that makes it come out as, as plain text. Yeah. Uh, now, depending on what it is you're capturing, it might be harder to tell what's the right original plain text and what's not. Mm, okay. But the more data you have, the more likely you are to notice the right pattern. Right. Right. Only the right key will have a pattern where you can actually read stuff. Interesting uh, interesting uh, question. And uh, I bet some other people were wondering about that. So John writes yeah. in with our... Um, I, I used to have an article about how hashing hash passwords actually work, but I think I forgot to renew that domain name. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I still have the happens. content somewhere. I just don't know <laughs> yep. if it's actually posted anywhere. Been there, done that. It was actually the domain name I let expire because it was for uh, this idea I had for a podcast back uh, when I was still in college. Uh, as I was graduating, I was going to recruit a couple of the professors to do a podcast with me uh -huh. called the Geek Roundtable, nice. where we would talk about things kind of like TechSnap. Yeah. It's funny uh, how that works. But yes, this has worked out much better because I don't have to do the production stuff, which was going to be the hard part. <laughs> uh, okay, so John writes in, and uh, this is our feel-good email of the day. And don't forget, we want your emails. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, send them in. John writes in, says, hey, JB Crew, I was made redundant about two months ago. I'm married with young kids and a mortgage. I'm the main earner of the family, and without money, we can't pay the mortgage. I even had to cancel my Netflix and JB Patreon subscriptions. It was a tough six weeks. Roller coaster doesn't even begin to describe it. Four weeks in, I hit a wall. I thought I'd never get a job, and maybe life was over. Our house was gone. Probably the lowest point in my life to date. But then I found a small ad from a local company looking for consultants to provide professional services for the implementation of business intelligence applications. They mentioned in the ad they were looking for tech lovers, not just someone who can or someone who wants to. They want somebody who loves it. That was me, I thought. So after three interviews, I'm in. I have a good job and I'm back at work. Some intensive training for the next few weeks and I'm looking forward to it. Without your shows, I would not have tried 90% of the things I could put on my resume. Without your shows, I would not have known half of the terms used. Without your shows, I would not have had a broad understanding of the internet enterprise technology space. When one of the interviewers said proudly, we run FreeBSD servers here, expecting me to be confused, 
I said, wow, that's awesome. Are you using ZFS? His face was the picture of shock and admiration. I know it might seem over the top, but I'm genuinely and honestly grateful to you for creating the shows you do every single week. It's amazing. Most of my physical friends are not into tech like me, so you guys are a lifeline and keep me up to date with the tech world. I'll stop gushing, but thank you again. And P.S. I just reactivated my Patreon. Well, awesome. John, that's awesome. And he emailed. He's like, guys, you never read my emails, John. We just didn't get you in the uh, in yeah, the uh, two show window. Yeah, uh, but love to know uh, the name of the company that is using FreeBSD servers. We're yeah. looking to profile more of uh, those on uh, the BSD Now show, and and just uh, the FreeBSD doc team in, in general is working on a big list of. Uh, various places that use FreeBSD. So if they're proud of it, which we hope most people are, uh, we'd love to know more about that as well. And congratulations to you, John. That's yes. really great to hear. I'm glad we could help. So uh, 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 one of our uh, regulars in the chat room is reminding us that uh, there is a call for papers for BSD CAN 2015. Let's give that a yes. plug. Uh, and this uh, yes. is, a, like, we have so, the link in the show notes, so I assume you probably have to have something good to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So but, that's uh, that's requirement, but other than that, e- even if you're not writing a paper, uh, right, you yes. definitely come. Uh, big change for this year is that it will be in June instead of May, so the weather will be even nicer, and it'll avoid uh, the oh. Comic Con and the um, the marathon. So you'll actually be able to get a hotel room <laughs> if you want. Although uh, the great other great thing about BSD Can is because it's held at the University of Ottawa during the summer. The uh, dorm rooms are available uh, instead of a hotel room, and they are super cheap Ooh. if you get them early enough before they run out of them. Uh, so, uh, and the, it's also great because you're on site with the conference, so you don't have to travel from your hotel back to the conference. No venue. kidding. No you're kidding. You're literally just walking across campus. Oh, man. Uh, and because it's a campus, there's lots of little stuff around, places to eat, uh, and there's a little pub nearby where we all hang out. Uh, BSD can was my first introduction to the BSD conferences and what got me addicted to them and going to them all the time. And it's still my favorite, uh, partly because the hackers lounge, uh, in the lobby of the residence building at the, uh, the university, uh, we take over a room there in the, in the lobby and people are hacking until like three in the morning, every morning. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, or just, you know, you're working on stuff and being able to look over, see the guy who invented the thing you're working on and ask him that one question and you can go, right? If you're trying to do it <laughs> online, awesome. you'd email him in the week later, get a response. Right, and yeah. be like, I don't have time to do that it's right too now. Busy. And then you forgot what you were doing and whatever. But yeah, it was just um, the energy you get from just a room full of people that are all excited and working on things. It's just amazing. So bsdcan.org. And if you have questions, papers at bsdcan.org. Is where to go. Uh, they also have uh, some proposals from previous years available, so you can see what other people wrote that ah, got accepted. Nice, nice. Um, they talk about you know what kind of stuff they're looking for, uh, and all that great stuff. Yeah. And also, you uh, speakers do not pay to get into the conference; it's all covered. Uh, they also pay for your flight and accommodations, but you have to pay for your own food and drink because they know better than to try to, to offer to pay for a, a BSD person's beer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I should. Uh, I, I need a good excuse to travel to the city of Ottawa. Would a Linux guy be welcome at a conference like that? Alex? Oh yes, we have lots of Linux people there. I should go. I we should will totally convert do it. you. But <laughs> I, I could get a. I could get my passport business in order by then. Oh yeah, you should definitely come. It'd be hmm. amazing. So bsdcan.org, and uh, we'll have a link in the show notes for that. And you know, I already mentioned it today, but we really we want TechSnap to get a good showing from the uh, fans of the show. Uh, please consider submitting to our best of JB forum for TechSnap. Uh, that's linked in the show notes again. And we're just really looking uh, for some moments. That way uh, we can give Alan the week off and technically still have new content for you. And the idea would be also, maybe this is a way to look at this, if you thought about introducing TechSnap to somebody, this form, what we hope is we get enough moments that we could put together an episode that then you, the fans, could hand out to folks and be like, watch this. This will give you an idea of the stuff TechSnap covers. And uh, it could be a good way to help spread the word about the show, too. So I'll have a link to that in the show notes. So looking for submissions for the best of still. Just another plug for that to be really obnoxious. Okay, Alan. Well, the feedback's all done. And don't forget, TechSnap at JupiterBroadcasting.com or the, uh, fe- or the feedback form over at JupiterBroadcasting.com slash contact. But with all of the feedback covered for this week, that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. <laughs> Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup for stories that just didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to give you some links to read up on your own after the show. And some of these links came from our great subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com. 
like our first story this week. We've got more details <clears throat> excuse me, on how the NSA managed to break GSM carrier encryption. This is from a report that was first published on uh, Glenn Greenwald's Intercept. Essentially, mm-hmm. the NSA is spying on internal emails and documents of major mobile carriers in the industry body, the GSM Association. And then, by according to the piece at least, the spy agency is using a program, to, uh, sort of an umbrella program to do all this called Aurora Gold, which involves targeting the GSMA, which is that association, in order to find out what the weak spots are in various carriers' networks technology. The GSMA's IR21 documents are shared between carriers to allow customers to roam internationally between their networks, so they have to collaborate. According to the NSA documents published by The Intercept, IR21s provide valuable information about how the technology the carriers are using is implemented, helping spies figure out how to discover vulnerabilities and introduce vulnerabilities where they don't exist, and then find threats to ex- with existing surveillance methods. Um, yeah, and then they go on about the encryption, so- too. The uh, carriers have to tell each other how their encryption works so right. that they can be compatible. And you get those emails. And it's also the, uh, I'm guessing, the group that's responsible for developing the next version of the encryption system that everybody will use. Right. And uh, as such, you know, they talk about, well, what was wrong with the old one that we want to fix on the new one? And I said, like, well, if you do this and this and this, the encryption gets really weak. Uh, and the NSA is like, ooh, goodies. The association uh, says, yeah, we're aware of the piece by The Intercept. Uh, and we're looking into it. No comment at this time. Uh, well, yes. Now, obviously, they don't want the information to get out, but you know, this is the kind of stuff you expect the NSA to be doing, being like, how can we spy on cell phones in other countries? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's talk about sausage love. It's, uh, the other, oh, <laughs> the other one there is just uh, by using this the Five Eyes kind of alliance thing, to be like, okay, so uh, let's have the British spy on the Americans right. and the Canadian spy on the Australians. Get around any of those Australians. pesky so domestic laws. So everybody's not looking at each other's stuff. Right, yeah. right. Um, yes, that's a, that is a very clever loop, a workaround loophole that they have there. Uh, all right, so sausage love, it's just not something that is about meat. I mean, I do love me some sausage, let's not lie, but it's also something to do with the Canadian government. <laughs> what yeah, is this? So, uh, there's a, a, a column, an ongoing column over uh, at Canada.com about uh, information security and, and servers and hacking and so on. Uh, and you know, the guy's like, I've been writing this article, uh, this column for a long time, trying to increase, to get, uh, raise awareness and get people to patch their servers and so on. Okay. Uh, but it seems it's done no good. Um, the Canadian government's NAFTA, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement website, uh, was hacked. Uh, people were told about it. And two weeks later, it's still showing the same hacked page. No. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. They yes, have some we screenshots. Have no bananas to bay. <laughs> That is that has got to be just a lack of resources. What like, well, how do you do? Like, how does that happen? It doesn't take much resources to redirect the index no. to like a, a static HTML page. <laughs> uh, sorry, down for maintenance or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> just now, put up anything. This, An under construction looks, guy. <laughs> like these don't look like very sophisticated hacks. These are regular defacements. Yes, right. Looks this like looks it. Looks like well, a. Uh, judging by the fact that the uh, HTML, the file name has a capital letter in it, means Windows to me. Yep. And also default that ASPX means that. Yeah. So this is a, a website that was hosted on a Windows server. Yeah. And has been defaced, uh, yeah. most likely automated fashion by a tool that went after whatever CMS they use or whatever. Uh, but in particular, he says that uh, uh, despite being publicly alerted uh, with the kind assistance of most uh, of some influential security and privacy accounts in the Twitter sphere for more than a week, uh, the government hasn't done anything about it. How embarrassing. Uh, my problem with that is sending a tweet to uh, the official Twitter account of uh, a high-ranking government official isn't really the same as disclosing to them true. that their website's been hacked. True, true. Uh, I mean, you would hope it would get up the chain, but that's very you, true. You pretty much assume that Tony Clement, who's like the minister of safety or something, I forget what he does, uh, doesn't, re- doesn't run his own Twitter account, no, right? That's no, an no. intern that He's got people that. for that. And, uh, you know... It's, it's not quite the same as disclosing that they've been hacked, but it does raise the question, how do you tell a government agency that their website's been hacked? It's not like they have an official email address that you could send this to or mm. a security officer you can call or what, right? Um, and in general, like even if, it, if we're not talking about governments, like when Sony was hacked, if people knew that Sony was being hacked ahead of time or that there was a certain vulnerability in their website, there isn't really a way for you to tell Sony that. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people do go to Twitter. 
Yeah, and with varying yeah, levels like, of success, probably, I suppose. Right, uh, but it, it almost raises the question: How are you supposed to do this? Yeah, um, you kind of Google it, it for almost, each company or each government like, and like find out. I mean, that's. It seems like that's what CERT is supposed to do, except for that one's more about you find a vulnerability, you tell CERT about it, and CERT will reach out to the security people at yeah. everybody yeah. in bulk. Yeah. And, yeah. But it seems like CERT maybe uh, should expand slightly, and when you find a problem in somebody's stuff and you don't have a way to reach them, yeah. you would contact CERT, and CERT would then contact the security officer for the, the government agency in this case, um, because... Well, of course, the problem with that is it, it means CERT is now basically the spam filter for everybody. Oh, yeah. Right? They have to yeah. weed out the crap and only send the good messages Who so has that time the messages for that? don't get ignored. Yeah. Uh, and yes, well, the CERT is funded by the Department of Homeland Security in the state, so they have unlimited money. So <laughs> they can do it. Print more when they need it. <laughs> uh, okay, this uh, next the one. The other interesting thing is mm. that the hack was uh, protesting uh, Bill C-13 and C-44, which are the most draconian and potentially foolhardy data Cana uh, Canadian data retention laws since the Second World War. Uh, hmm. But, yeah, it, it's pretty bad that uh, the government... Uh, really bad. That's embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, and then on the other side, like so you have that you have a government website that hasn't even been fixed after after it's been defaced then you flip yeah. over to uh speaking of unlimited funds now you really want to talk about unlimited funds US intelligence agencies aim to develop a superconducting computer the US intelligence community has launched a multi-year research project to develop this is according to recode a superconducting computer awarding its first contracts to three major technology companies IBM Raytheon and Northrop <laughs> just a surprise they all won the contracts the intelligence advanced research projects activity said Wednesday without disclosing any of the financial details to them the cryogenic computer complexity program could lead to a new generation of superconducting supercomputers said the unit of office of direct director of national intelligence hey how about that right out of the dni's office the energy demands of today's high performance computers have become critical ch a critical challenge for the intelligence community uh, and that c3 program ad ad aims to address this such computers uh, use massive amounts <clears throat> of energy that they have now like literally they're talking about what they said cryogenic so yeah. it's basically keeping it frozen yeah. so that uh, it can operate because it's going to produce so much heat welcome back to cray yeah. The C3 program is what they're calling it. Maybe we'll get something down to us peebs after a certain point. I don't know, Alan. I don't know. Uh, so there was a, a slash dot post that the chat room has been talking about today. The cost of the S in HTTPS. Mm -hmm. uh, so from, they break uh, down the, what, uh, you know, what the actual downsides are to using HTTPS everywhere um, into a couple of categories. Uh, specifically the direct costs, which are Things that happen because of TLS and the indirect costs, oh, okay. uh, like what we lose because everything is encrypted. And they break it down into five categories. One, deployment. How hard is it to actually do HTTPS? And they found it's not really hard. Yeah. You know, Google, Facebook, everybody just turned it on. It's really not that hard. It's, yeah. Two, load time. How much uh, longer does it make websites take to load? Seems like it's not insignificant, but it's not too onerous as well. Uh, data usage. How much more bandwidth is used? Uh, for energy consumption on your smartphone that's going HTTPS kill your battery faster. Turns out not too much. Okay. And then five was value-added services. Uh, now that everything's encrypted, it means caching proxies like Squid aren't going to save bandwidth, right? Like before, if you were a company and you had a lot of workstations, you'd install a Squid cache, and now, you know, if two people went to the same YouTube video, it wouldn't load it twice. Well, if it's encrypted, that maybe they do have to load it twice, and that causes various issues and stuff. Um... And then they, yeah, so they have graphs here of the load times and stuff. Uh, yeah, they have a presentation. It's a PDF, and so PDF warning, but yeah. There's also, a uh, the other thing is um, because of the beast attack, we've kind of disabled the idea of uh, uh, compressing stuff before you encrypt it. And uh, so that's costing a certain amount of extra data usage, uh, but not that much. Hmm. But the big one where it makes a difference is uh, caching at an ISP level, right? Uh, now, I don't like my ISP to do stuff like that, yeah. but I understand why they would because, yeah. uh, you know, even with a cache hit ratio of 15%, they'd be saving like 16 terabytes. But, you know, uh, they can do stuff like the Netflix box to do that kind of caching. Yeah. It's fine. 
Uh, yeah, and you know, speaking. So they say uh, users are unlikely to notice significant jumps in data usage due to the loss of compression, but ISPs stand to see a large increase in upstream traffic due to the uh, loss. I hadn't of thought cache. about it from the ISP angle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they talk about um, for phones, uh, for video playback on energy consumption, if uh, there was a proxy that was converting the video from WebM to MP4, that would use a lot less CPU on your phone. But I'm not aware of proxies doing that. No, so. no. Uh, uh, can I get one though? I hate WebM. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. And just... then, but the biggest one is you lose all the middle boxes that used to sit there and intercept stuff, uh, so you don't get the you know squid for compression and uh, compression. Right. I mean, it affects uh, corp- caching. Yep. Yep. Uh, Corporations virus get affected scanners, too. forensic ad yep. blockers, right? Uh, parental filtering, uh, app-aware load balancers, intrusion prevention systems, caching, transcoding, uh, app analytics, and stuff. Um, Ad blocking can be done on the client side. That one makes sense. Intrusion prevention, you do gain something from seeing all the traffic. Of course, you can put that on every box, but it gets harder, especially when you're talking about mobile devices. Uh, so for some of the stuff, uh, yes, you can see the problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are things uh, to solve that, like RelayD, uh, which basically by trusting a certificate, which you can do easily on a Windows Active Directory or whatever, you can have it intercept all the SSL. Uh, so it will, you would do SSL from the client computer to the edge of your network where the relay D is. Uh, and then the relay D would then also have SSL from that out to the internet. But in the middle of relay D, you can do all this stuff uh, on the decrypted version of the traffic. I, I, I look at this and I think to myself, like, as an end user, I'm like, ah, get over it. And then as the, the old IT guy, I mean, kind of creeps back up and I'm like, oh, yeah, except for this would actually screw with just enterprise level caching and yes, things and like it, that. It and that I care more about. Facebook right. Because I can't look for just the Facebook right. and yes. a bunch of things like that. But in the end, it's probably not that big of a deal. I suppose not. Uh, especially as uh, it, it does seem like something that people worry, what if? But then when, yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah. So it just means that we have that. to rethink how we do a number of these, yes. uh, the kind of middleman boxes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, speaking, and they have of, a link to they have a https dashboard dot com where they have fancy oh. graphics and charts. Https <laughs> dashboard. That's cool. That sounds neat. And they also uh, in the show notes yeah. we have linked the uh, so you go GitHub. to the story. They got the PDF in there with lots of stuff. Right, and in the PDF they also have their GitHub. Oh, look at that. That's cool. Uh, okay. All right. Well, uh, so speaking of changing how you do things, I don't know if you saw the story, but Google is working on making their reCAPTCHA system way better and way more interesting. So the old reCAPTCHA system was basically getting free work out of you to transcribe the stuff that they couldn't analyze very well. But now Google is using all of that super compute power of theirs to analyze if you're a bot by watching your behavior, if you're signed into your Google account, if your IP address is known to be safe or not, and the mouse movements you make on the page when you check the box that says, I'm not a bot. Google takes all of this into consideration and uses this to weigh how likely it is that you're a bot. And if you fall within a certain threshold, you no longer have to enter a CAPTCHA. You just check the box and that's enough. If you are outside a certain threshold, then you fall back to the old CAPTCHA system. I say right now about 60% uh, of, of users on, on uh, WordPress were able to avoid the CAPTCHA altogether. And 80% of users on the Humble Bundle website, the, these are sites that have been testing this new CAPTCHA system, 80% didn't have to enter that crappy CAPTCHA. Mm-hmm. Now, I think a big part of success is uh, you have to be signed into your Google account. It might ask you, like, it might show some pictures and say, here's a picture of a kitty. Which of the pictures below is like this picture? And then you choose that and you check a box and then Google figures out if you're a bot. So we could finally see the death of those horrible, horrible captures that we all hate. Especially on mm-hmm. mobile. Hate them so hard on mobile. Uh, okay. So our next roundup story. How Intel and Micron may have finally may finally kill the hard drive. A little what, Alan? Yes. Well, uh, two different kind of related things here. First of all, okay. Samsung has announced a 3.2 terabyte uh, PCI Express SSD. Uh, and Intel and Micron have announced that Intel is sharing their 3D technology with Micron, so we'll have 3D NAND. Remember, Intel invented the 3D um, transistors. Uh, and so this will allow SSDs to finally catch up to hard drives at uh, in capacity-wise. Right before, uh, Originally, hard drives were good, because they were, and then SSDs were better because they were faster, but they could never catch up to the yeah. size yeah. or the... Um, the cost right uh, now 
if they lose size as well, then uh, spinning hard drives will be competing simply on uh, cost. Well, because uh, you know, hard drives they found they can't really make them go faster than seventy two hundred RPM. It's like you remember when they used to have Raptors? They were like you know seventy four gigs and they were fifteen thousand RPM. <laughs> but they found that the faster uh, it drives, the drives get too hot and then they fail. Yes, they do. <laughs> <clears throat> I've I've noticed that too, Alan. As yeah. a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, well, I just noticed like even 10k RPM isn't really a big thing anymore. No, um, um, it, it's getting harder and harder to find because that's what we use in our recording rig here. Yeah, uh, but SSDs still have a way to go to catch up on cost. Yeah, um, you know, I've seen, you know, the kind of the magic point that people have been talking about is um, 50 cents a gig. Uh, Black Friday sale, I managed to get SSDs at like. What was it uh, thirty seven point five cents a gig? Oh, that's sweet. Uh, but I also got spinning hard drives for three cents a gig. That's almost that's getting close to free. Literally ten times cheaper. <laughs> that's well, not a, free. It's still no, hundred bucks I know. for I'm three totally terabytes. Ninety, 90 yeah. dollars for three terabytes. No, but, I know. Uh, and so you got. So what was the total price for a three terabyte drive then? The, the they were the three terabyte drives were eighty nine ninety nine. And Love it. So we're uh, or for the same eighty nine ninety nine, I could get a two hundred and forty gig <sighs> SSD. I got oh man, now, I got the so, SSD is faster, uh, more IOPS, but you know I'm after storage. I spent all my Black Friday money on truck repairs. I was so hoping yeah. to upgrade storage in the studio over Black Friday, but mm. I got to make my priorities. Yep. And you know I could have put it on credit, but I just didn't feel like that was a good way to go. No, that's not a good way to go. No. That's just uh, paying more for it. Yeah, yeah. Interesting though. It's boy, I'm so glad to see these prices go this direction. Uh, I, I a recent Twitter account that I actually started following ended up in the uh, in the roundup this week. Uh, and it's it's a great. I love the tweet. It's signed. Must be legit. And it's a it's a like a pop up. Do you want to run this Java applet? Credit yeah. card information stealer <laughs> is the name. But it's signed. <laughs> uh, well, the jar, if you look, is actually loaded from Java.com. Holy crap! You're right. So what happened? Uh, I. Either uh, I'm uh, they don't provide the detail. No, we don't clean. know. Yeah, uh, but I think uh, this is to show people that uh, they have to actually read these. Yeah, or you know, just if, how many people will click run even though it says credit card information stealer. Right. That or um, they've managed to fake the signature. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I didn't even catch it, the Java.com. Basically, part. it's it's possible that it's either um, the Java detection dot jar on Oracle dot on Java dot com accidentally slipped out with the funny title uh or someone is spoofed a signature uh he didn't really normally when they tweet something like this they also have a link to a blog post that explains it right. not in this case uh but. jaded infosec pro is the twitter handle or is actually edward uh, mccabe but yeah pretty yeah. good stuff i've been i've been finding i've been finding his feed to be interesting Cool. Uh, next site, I almost want to feature this one in last too. explain shell.com i think this was sent in yes. by a listener right it was yeah great resource uh, so explain to us, Alan, what explainshell.com is. Right. So you put in a string of shell script. Uh, I have an example one here. Yeah. Uh, and then it highlights the different sections and explains what they do. This is so handy. So the first part of the command is obviously running true, uh, which, as it explains, does nothing successfully. And you can highlight um, over it, and it'll highlight yeah. just that area of explanation, which is really cool, Right. Too. And when there's multiple things of the same thing, it can... Uh, Drives collapses lines that down to just one, yes. so you don't have to do it. This is nice. Uh, or, for example, the and and the or. Uh, so there's command true and false, and they just return either true returns uh, error code zero, which is success, or false returns error code one. Uh, so they're just a way to to do that. And then the double ampersand is how you. Um, it's, it's an and operation, so it means only do the second command if the first command exit is successfully. So true. It does nothing successfully, and then only if that worked, which it always will, <laughs> then do this. And yeah. then they have uh, a curly brace, which is just uh, how you do a list of commands. Uh, and then in their list, they just have echo uh, oh, success. This is so sweet. So they echo out uh, the success. And yeah. uh, they've, they've improved it now, actually. It's hard link. Uh, they have links of all the commands to uh, their man pages. In the case of echo, they actually have uh, the different man pages since your echo might be different on different uh, oh, operating systems. Like they have uh, the POSIX Echo or the regular Echo or uh, Plan 9's Echo. Yeah, they do. <laughs> uh, and then they have OR. Uh, so they have uh, double pipe, which means only do the second command. If the first one failed, then the Echo's failed. Now, obviously, this one will always output true because you're running the true command. Unless somehow you don't have a true command, then it'll fail. 
and it'll print out those messages. Explainshell.com. Yeah. And uh, so you can stick in any bit of shell code that you don't understand, and it will pop out an explanation of how it works. That's a good resource. That's a good uh, one. I've mentioned it before, but the uh, similar one is shellcheck.net. You put in some shell code, and it tells you what's wrong yeah. with it. Yeah. Uh, it will point out one. common mistakes people make uh, or assumptions you might have made and not realized. Uh, you know, it finds stuff like, oh, if you uh, don't put quotes around this and somebody puts a space in there, it could do nasty things. Or you did RM and then this variable. If someone puts, uh, a, if one of the file names has a dash in it, they can cause you to delete something you didn't mean to. I think we talked right? about this about five weeks ago. And I, yeah, yeah, uh, for, yeah, we talked about, you know, if, if I create a file in a directory called minus RF space slash or something, and then you your shell script runs rm that variable name without uh doing the the double dash in rm first uh instead of removing the file it will uh, remove your whole hard drive which would be bad uh okay alan that's it i'm, I'm bookmarking right now i want to bring it yeah. up in an episode of last too uh okay Another roundup story for us. Hackers have thre- hackers that were threatened with uh, 44 felony charges get away with just a misdemeanor. Yeah, so this is a tactic we've seen the government uh, prosecutors use before. So they arrest somebody and they immediately slap 44 felony charges right. each with a 10-year sentence at the person. Right. And you figure so maybe somebody's in their 20s or 30s. You're going to 450 years yeah. in jail. You're in your 20s or 30s. That's going to make you lose your S. Yeah. All right, this is what they did to the Aaron Schwartz and stuff, right? Yes. So, yeah, they're right. like, oh, we're going to charge you with everything we can think of. It's like wire fraud and internet fraud and this fraud and everything, everything we can think of. Uh, in the end, the guy gets uh, a single misdemeanor, no jail time, just a fine. Uh, but the government tried to uh, charge him with everything to scare him into accepting a plea deal and so on, uh, or just to, you know, just being mean, basically. Um, and it doesn't seem like very honest uh, justice there. <laughs> no. When you're, when you're it's, just... It's like, it's not a monopoly abuse. It's not that, but it does feel like an abuse of power, for sure. It does, like... Yeah, uh, and just evil tactics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, threatening for someone with, like, five life sentences if they don't uh, accept a plea deal is pretty bad. Right, right. Uh, Alan... It's like, at that point, it's like even if uh, there was a question of your innocence, it's like, well, do I take this oh, fine you, yeah. or do I risk going to jail mm. for five lifetimes? No, yeah, I know. It, it, it's that's why they do it that way. It's yep. kind of sad, really. Uh, Alan, what would it take today for me to put you in a nice, beautiful, brand new, fresh installed CentOS rig? I can guarantee CentOS enterprise grade stability. And uh, never going to have any kind of problems at all, like with CentOS 6 and touching a bunch of init files. Well, see, see there's this feature that the Linux kernel grew Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> called iNotify. Uh-huh. Oh, yes, it's very handy. It doesn't have, and some, a bunch of apps have been complaining wait, about wait, it. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. Before you go, what do you yeah. do for I.O. event notification? We have uh, KQ. Okay. So, all right. Uh, but we basically don't have one to notify you when a file okay. gets created. You have to kind of build... We have a generic system that works for anything, and you have to kind of build that extra bit yourself. Okay. I uh, know there's a... Actually, somebody's written a library that will do it on all the operating systems using each operating system's unique local thing. Oh, that's cool. Or falling back to actually pulling the directory if it has to. Okay. Uh, but uh, I notify is good, and uh, FreeBSD is growing a version of it. Yeah. But... Um, because of bad code uh, in CentOS 6 in the init daemon, uh, where it doesn't check for an error, it doesn't. It always assumes that iNotify is going to return success and not an error. Oh. So if you cause <laughs> an overflow error by basically sending, uh, touching so many files in the directory that uh, Notify is watching, that it's like, I'm just going to stop spamming you with notifications and tell you, hey, there's a lot of notifications. Um, it... Uh, basically crashes the NIT and takes down the whole system. Wow. And then there was a proposed patch, uh, but the problem was the patch would just ignore, uh, basically would just stop, uh, doing, ignore the error instead of crashing. Uh, but that meant that you would then not actually process the events that happened. Oh, that's no good. 
So, uh, yeah, there's some, uh, quite a bit of arguing going on of what is the correct way to patch this. So this isn't necessarily an upstart-specific thing. It's more of an IO notify-specific thing. So well, it could no, be. it's a bug in upstart where it doesn't deal with the fact that notify, uh, iNotify can give an error saying there's too many notifications. Ah, so what you're saying so is the fix is part. to upgrade to systemd. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes and no. Basically, it shows that putting more and more of this stuff into init is not necessarily yeah. a good thing because yeah. when it crashes, there's no recourse. It's a mess. Yet. Yeah, it's a mess. That's for that. I totally right. agree. So, having less complexity there instead of more mm. might be a better idea. Mm. All right. It's been far too long since the TechSnap show has talked about Dropbox. This is a huge ass slash dot well, write up. This one technically isn't actually about Dropbox. It just happens to involve Dropbox. Right. Right. So, what do we have here? What is this? Uh, so, uh, some. Transparency organization uh, is suing the office of the mayor somewhere in Orange County, I think, in, in California, uh, for a list of the IP addresses that accessed a certain Dropbox. Oh, okay. Uh, that belonged to the mayor or something, uh, because they believe that the mayor was sharing certain information with other people that they weren't supposed to. Via Dropbox. Like lobbyists or something. Oh. Uh, so they asked uh, for a list of all the IP addresses that accessed it. And what they got back were all the IP addresses were redacted, and the uh, IT people said, no, it's bad security if we give out our IP addresses. Uh, and a judge ruled that, no, uh, you can't claim that uh, the IP addresses are part of the security system of your uh, network, and you can't give them out and stuff. Uh, this one's kind of a little bit about, I, I understand how knowing all the, the layout of the IP addresses inside a network could cause something or you know knowing the public ip addresses sure, or yeah, something yeah but in general finding the public ip address or something is not hard if no. it's a private ip address then you have to get in the network before that it's information not going to value anyway yeah uh so i've never quite understood people you know trying to redact ip addresses especially when they're asking for help with their network configuration and they go and like change the ip addresses and they never do it quite right and so the output they give you isn't actually the same as what it would have been if they hadn't modified the IP addresses, and it makes it harder to help them. And just, like, stop being paranoid and just leave your IP addresses alone. Yeah. That's uh, an interesting story, though, but I, I was yeah, curious uh, about going well, to Dropbox and asking for these IPs. Well, I don't know if Dropbox is really related in this in any way. I, I'm, I'm almost wondering, did the IT department of the mayor have to go to Dropbox and get the list of IPs and then give those Probably. out no. or was it like they have logs of every external connection and they just got all the ones that went mm. from the office to Dropbox mm. but then how do you tell which Dropbox account because Dropbox is over HTTPS yeah so it's uh, interesting to see what's going on there uh, but the main reason they brought it up is while well, the judge ended up making the right ruling uh, his justification for why he did it was basically showing that he didn't actually understand what was happening yeah uh, so they break down uh, that in the in the post there pretty good. So I recommend people take a look at that. Look at Slashdot. I've been reading Slashdot more recently, actually. I don't it's know. It's hit or miss a lot of yeah, times. Yeah, it but is. But like this is like you a know, there's a whole story on there. Uh, interesting. Steve Wozniak was saying. Yeah. You know, people are obsessed with this whole idea that Apple started in a garage. Right. It's like we used the garage because we couldn't afford anything else. Nothing ever actually happened in the garage. Like we didn't ever breadboard something yeah, or actually. Yeah manufacture anything in the garage it was just a place we could go because we didn't have any money for an office yeah yeah right that's why i started in the garage it was a lot cheaper right. and mm -hmm. now now i'm not in the garage uh okay so uh you know when i think about the most destructive weapons on the planet known to mankind this whole password problem where there's not a lot of protection between i mean of course there's protection but when it comes to passwords alan i just i want to know it's secure as possible and this yeah, next story I might help me sleep better Right. Uh, well, the uh, the video never made it online. I don't know what happened with the videos from uh, EuroBSTCon 2013. Ah, uh, yeah. But on the right. keynote for the second day, uh, there was this interesting tidbit that came up that the launch code for the U.S. nuclear arsenal uh, was zero 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 until like 1976 or something. Uh, yes. Because right. there was always a concern that people under stress would forget or whatever. And uh, so it was, uh, I forget, one of the presidents had a, an eidetic memory, like a photographic memory. So he wanted to know what the actual password was. <laughs> he was the first person to actually ask to know what the password was. Cause like, and they're like, no, you don't need the password. There's this guy holding the briefcase. He will always know it. It's like, no, I want to know. Don't make me order you to tell me. Um, and the guy's like, well, I don't actually know the password. They just told me to keep pressing zero until this light comes on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
right? Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, so obviously they had the same password problem, right? That's There's, a real like, story, too. That's, like, not yes, a joke. That's, that's a real story. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, this is a talk about uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories has come up with a new system for the nuclear weapons. Okay. Uh, where... Uh, each weapon has a use code, right? Uh, so basically the password that allows that weapon to be activated. Instead of having those be fixed numbers that are written down somewhere or something, uh, their idea is actually to use the fluctuating radiation field that comes out of the weapon as kind of like a one-time password because it's always changing. Right, unique. So the weapon would be the only thing that knows its own code. <laughs> I think this is interesting. I wonder I if you could expand... all the details yet, yeah, but that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, it is very. And I wonder if you could expand it to other things, too, that have kind of a similar idea. Uh, something unique to each weapon, right? Mm. That's, that's, that's I think, a pretty, a pretty then, ingenious system. So the question system. becomes, do you either just have to know the unique signature of the weapon to be able to unlock it? Or is it like you have to have a certain measuring device right. and measure the radiation and, coming out of it? Well, and yeah, then, because would that radiation change? Like if it's like, if it's like a, a warhead that's been sitting in a silo for 35 years, is it yeah. different 35 years later? Well, it did say it's fluctuating, so it changes. Yeah. So it's like, do you just need a certain device to measure it and then you just tell it what it was 10 seconds or ago? Or when you measure it, you it, capture or? what that number was and then you know it's based off of this number. Right, when you yeah, capture uh, it. Um, you'd have to read the article more, and I don't know if they've actually disclosed all the details they to that. They probably haven't. But um, the idea of having one-time passwords for nuclear weapons seems better than having static passwords. Now, uh, Alan, our or, last... Or really, what they should have there maybe is uh, two-factor authentication. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I hope they do. I'm going to assume they do. Well, that's uh, kind of the idea of the two-man rule. Right? Yes. Yeah. The oh, Yeah, the OG two-factor. Uh, this next drive. You know me, Alan. I hate computer sounds, I hate computer noises. In a production environment, having my equipment be absolutely silent is critical. So this new 500 gigabyte hard drive uh, might just be it for me. Uh, and this was a tweet. He opens up his hard drive. You think this is real, Alan? Inside, for you audio listeners, this guy cracks open a USB external hard drive. It's yeah, got... which is like a plastic case. Yeah. And inside are uh, two big bolts and some nuts super, uh, hot glued to the case. And then uh, the USB port is wired to a little USB thumb drive, uh, like not even one that had a case, like just the circuit board stuck into a USB port. Is this real, Alan? So they, they, they just bought, you know, cheap Chinese flash drives and then put them in cases. Glued them? Yeah, it's like, well, if people wanted that, why wouldn't they just want... you think? Do you think this is real? Like, do they have 500 gig thumb drives yet? I think the biggest I've seen is 128 gigs, but... Maybe they do. Wow. It is entirely possible. It's fake. Or it wasn't. Or it, was it wasn't five hundred gigabytes. That's the yeah. other thing. Is it good? Yeah. Like there's not enough going on in there that it's. I, I would assume it's doing compression or something to try to to squeeze data into it. But it's just funny because it actually has, like it's it's a regular USB stick with the USB um, male end on it yes. stuck into the, a female end that just got the wire the wires to the port. Yeah. For the external part, and there's just two big bolts in it to give it weight. Uh, hot glued down to make it have the right weight. <laughs> This uh, is so funny. I think hilarious. it's real. It, it, it looks real enough. I just, um, I question how they got 500 gigs on that USB stick. Or maybe honestly. it doesn't. Actually, some of the people in, on the Twitter feed were like, is it really 500 gigs? Hey, yeah, but you know what? I want to buy that USB stick. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that's not a bad deal for 500 gigabyte USB stick. Yeah, and at that point, you know, you're, is that like an SSD? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Q5 system chair says biggest he's seen on the market is 256. But yeah, and most of the ones I've seen are quite a bit bigger than that. So I I would assume that's definitely not 500 gigs. Maybe that's uh, why he opened it up. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah, one question. Uh, but yeah, uh, if, if that started to happen more, the uh, the guys at Backblaze with their drive shucking wouldn't get very far. No, right. Yeah, <laughs> it does make drive shucking work very well. Maybe they could just do an array of thumb drives. <laughs> Put them in a raid. Call it good. Ah, okay. Uh, Rikai says that it's not a 500 gig drive. It's actually a 16 gig thumb drive with the firmware hack to make it report 500 gigs. That was the explanation. He says that yep. sounds feasible and a big scam too. Yep. Because huh. uh, yeah, for a 500 gig charge, you can try a uh, 500 gig drive. You can charge a bit, and then uh, yeah, I would have been. This would have been me too. I've been like, oh, it's so quiet. It doesn't even vibrate. This is great. And then I would have filled it up and been like, oh, what's going on? I could totally see that happening to me. Uh, that's sometimes what can happen when you get a Cyber Monday deal, I suppose, or a Black Friday deal. Sometimes the price is too good to be true. 
Well, Alan, is there anything else we want to cover on the uh, TechSnap program before nope. we run? That's the end of it. All right. Well, then don't forget we've got that best of submission form we want. We also want your emails. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and send them in to us. And last but not least, don't forget to join us live on Thursdays. We'll have some double recording sessions coming up in the near future, too, so check out jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar for those. But join us, jblive.tv, 1 p.m. Pacific, which is? 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Boom! Over jblive.tv for the video and jblive.info for the audio version. Also, RSS feeds you can subscribe to, and then you just get every single new episode of TechSnap automatically without even having to think about it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week.